Indiana Rules of Court Rules of Trial Procedure Including amendments made through January 1, 2020 Table of Contents Rule 1 Scope of the Rules 3 Rule 2 One Form of Action 3 Rule 3 Commencement of an Action 3 Rule 3.1 Appearance 3 Rule 4 Process 4 Rule 4.1 Summons, Service on Individuals 5 Rule 4.2 Summons, Service upon Infant or Incompetence 5 Rule 4.3 Summons, Service upon Institutionalized Persons 6 Rule 4.4 Service upon persons and actions for acts done in the state or having an effect in the state. 6 Rule 4.5 Summons, service upon resident who cannot be found or served within the state. 7 Rule 4.6 Service upon organizations 7 Rule 4.7 Summons, service upon agent named by statute or agreement 7 Rule 4.8 Summons, service of pleadings or summons on Attorney General. 8 Rule 4.9 Summons, in rem actions. 8 Rule 4.10 Summons, service upon Secretary of State or other governmental agent. 8 Rule 4.11 Summons, registered or certified mail. 8 Rule 4.12 Summons, service by sheriff or other officer. 8 Rule 4.13 Summons, service by publication. 9 Rule 4.14 Service under special order of court. 10 Rule 4.15 Summons, proof of service return amendments defects. 10 Rule 4.16 Summons, Duties of persons to aid in service. 10 Rule 4.17 Summons, certain proceedings accepted. 11 Rule 5 Service and filing of pleading and other papers. 11 Rule 6 Time. 13 Rule 7 Pleadings allowed form of motion. 14 Rule 8 General Rules of Pleading 14 Rule 9 Pleading Special Matters 15 Rule 9.1 Pleading and Proof of Contributory Negligence Assume Risk Reciprocal Consideration bona fide Purchaser Matters of Judicial Notice Answer of Distraint 16 Rule 9.2 Pleading and Proof of Written Instruments 16 Rule 10. Form of Pleading. 17 Rule 11. Signing and Verification of Pleadings. 18 Rule 12. Defenses and Objections when and how presented by pleading or motion motion for judgment on the Pleadings 18 Rule 13. Counterclaim and Cross-Claim. 19 Rule 14. Third Party Practice 21 Rule 15 Amended and Supplemental Pleadings 22 Rule 16 Pre-Trial Procedure, Formulating Issues 22 Rule 17 Parties Plaintiff and Defendant Capacity 24 Rule 17.1 Parties, State as Party Attorney General 25 Rule 18. Joinder of Claims and Remedies. 25 Rule 19. Joinder of Person Needed for Just Adjudication. 25 Rule 20. Permissive Joinder of Parties. 26 Rule 21. Miss Joinder and Non Joinder of Parties. Venue and Jurisdiction over the Subject Matter. 27 Rule 22. Interpleader 27 Rule 23. Class.
Actions 28 Rule 23.1 Derivative Actions by Shareholders 29 Rule 23.2 Actions Relating to Unincorporated Associations 30 Rule 24 Intervention 30 Rule 25 Substitution of Parties 30 Rule 26 General Provisions Governing Discovery 31 Rule 27 Depositions Before Action or Pending Appeal 34 Rule 28 Persons Before Whom Depositions May Be Taken Discovery Across State Lines Before Administrative Agencies And After Judgment 35 Rule 29 Stipulations Regarding Discovery Procedure 36 Rule 30. Depositions upon oral examination 36 Rule 31. Deposition of witnesses upon written questions. 38 Rule 32. Use of depositions in court proceedings. 39 Rule 33. Interrogatories to parties. 40 Rule 34. Production of documents, electronically stored information and things and entry upon land for inspection and other purposes. 41 Rule 35 Physical and Mental Examination of Persons 42 Rule 36 Requests for Admission 43 Rule 37 Failure to make or cooperate in discovery, sanctions 43 Rule 38 Jury Trial of Right 45 Rule 39. Trial by jury or by the court. 45 Rule 40. Assignment of cases for trial. 46 Rule 41. Dismissal of actions. 46 Rule 42. Consolidation separate trials. 47 Rule 43. Evidence. 48 Rule 44. Proof of official record. 48 Rule 44.1 Determination of foreign law. 48 Rule 45 Subpoena. 48 Rule 46 Exceptions unnecessary. 49 Rule 47 Jurors and peremptory challenges. 49 Rule 48 Juries of less than six majority verdict. 50 Rule 49. Special verdicts and interrogatories. 50 Rule 50. Judgment on the evidence, directed verdict. 50 Rule 51. Instructions to jury, objections, requests, submission and stages. 51 Rule 52. Findings by the court. 51 Rule 53. Masters. 52 Rule 53.1. Failure to rule on motion. 53 Rule 53.2. Time for holding issue under advisement. Delay of entering a judgment. 55 Rule 53.3. Motion to correct error. Time limitation for ruling. 55 Rule 53.4 Repetitive motions and motions to reconsider Time for holding under advisement Automatic denial 55 Rule 53.5 Continuances 56 Rule 54 Judgment Costs 56 Rule 55 Default 56 Rule 56 Summary Judgment 57 Rule 57 Declaratory Judgments 58 Rule 58 Entry and Content of Judgment 58 Rule 59 Motion to Correct Error 59 Rule 60 Relief from Judgment or Order 60 Rule 60.5 Mandate of Funds 
61 rule 61 harmless error 62 rule 62 stay of proceedings to enforce a judgment 62 rule 63 disability and unavailability of a judge 64 rule 63.1 List pendants notice of proceedings avoiding judgments and circumstances tolling and extending statutes of limitations, assignments and discharges and list pendants and judgment dockets, list pendants notices and cases involving interest in personal property. 65 Rule 64. Seizure of person or property. 66 Rule 65. Injunctions 67 Rule 65.1 Security, Proceedings Against Sureties 69 Rule 66 Receivers, Assignees for the Benefit of Creditors and Statutory and Other Liquidators Claims Against Such Officers 69 Rule 67 Deposit and Court, Payment of Judgment 70 Rule 68. Offer of Judgment. 70 Rule 69. Execution, Proceedings Supplemental to Execution, Foreclosure Sales. 70 Rule 70. Judgment for Specific Acts. Vesting Title. Recordation. 71 Rule 71. Process on behalf of and against persons not parties. 72 Rule 72. Trial Court and Clerks. 72 Rule 73. Hearing of Motions. 73 Rule 74. Recording Machines. Court Reports. Stenographic Report or Transcript as Evidence. 73 Rule 75. Venue Requirements. 74 Rule 76. Change. Of Venue 75 Rule 77. Court Records. 76 Rule 78. Jurisdiction Pending Change from County. 78. Rule 79.1. Special Judge Selection, City, Town, and Marion County Small Claims Courts. 81 Rule 80. Supreme Court Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure 82 Rule 81 Local Court Rules 83 Rule 81.1 Procedures for Cases Involving Family or Household Members 84 Rule 82 Forms 84 Rule 83 Definitions 84 Rule 84 Effective Date 85 Rule 85. Vacated. 85 Rule 86. Electronic Filing and Electronic Service. 85. Rule 1. Scope of the Rules. Except as otherwise provided, these rules govern the procedure and practice in all courts of the state of Indiana and all suits of a civil nature whether cognizable as cases at law inequity, or of statutory origin. They shall be construed to secure the just, speedy and inexpensive determination of every action. Rule 2. One form of action. A. There shall be one, one form of action to be known as civil action. B. The right of a civil action is not merged in a public offense or a public remedy, but may, in all cases, be sought independently of and in addition to the punishment given or relief granted for the public offense. Rule 3. Commencement of an action. A civil action is commenced by filing with the court a complaint or such equivalent pleading or document as may be specified by statute, by payment of the prescribed filing fee or filing an order waiving the filing fee, and where service of process is required, by furnishing to the clerk as many copies of the complaint and summons as are necessary. Rule 3.1 Appearance 
a initiating party. At the time an action is commenced, the attorney representing the party initiating the proceeding or the party, if not represented by an attorney, shall file with the clerk of the court an appearance form setting forth the following information. 1. Name, address, telephone number, fax number, and email address of the initiating party or parties filing the appearance form. 2. Name, address, attorney number, telephone number, fax number, and email address of any attorney representing the party, as applicable. 3. The case type of the proceeding Administrative Rule 8 B. 3. 4. Unless required by Trial Rule 86 G. A statement that the party will or will not accept service by fax or by email from other parties. 5. In domestic relations, uniform reciprocal enforcement of support, urisa, paternity, delinquency, child in need of services, shins, guardianship, and any other proceedings in which support may be an issue. The social security identification number of all family members. 6. The caption and case number of all related cases. 7. Such additional matters specified by state or local rule required to maintain the information management system employed by the court. 8. In a proceeding involving a protection from abuse order, a workplace violence restraining order, or a no contact order, the initiating party shall provide to the clerk a public mailing address for purposes of legal service. The initiating party may use the Attorney General Address Confidentiality Program established by statute. And 9. In a proceeding involving a mental health commitment, except 72-hour emergency detentions, the initiating party shall provide the full name of the person with respect to whom commitment is sought in the person's state of residence. In addition, the initiating party shall provide at least one of the following identifiers for the person. A. Date of birth. B. Social security number. C. Driver's license number with state of issue and date of expiration. D. Department of correction number. E. State ID number with state of issue and date of expiration. Or F. FBI number. 10. In a proceeding involving a petition for guardianship, the initiating party shall provide a completed guardianship information sheet in the form set out in Appendix C. The information sheet is a confidential court record excluded from public access under the rules on access to court records. B. Responding parties. At the time the responding party or parties first appears in a case, the attorney representing such party or parties, or the party or parties, if not represented by an attorney, shall file an appearance form setting forth the information set out in Section A above. C. Intervening parties. At the time the first matter is submitted to the court seeking to intervene in a proceeding, the attorney representing the intervening party or parties, or the intervening party or parties, if not represented by an attorney, shall file an appearance form setting forth the information set out in Section A. Above. D. Confidentiality of court record excluded from public access. Any appearance form or court record defined as not accessible to the public pursuant to the rules on access to court records shall be filed in the manner required by Rule 7 of the Rules on Access to Court Records. E. Completion and correction of information. In the event matters must be filed before the information required by this rule is available, the appearance form shall be submitted with available information and supplemented when the absent information is acquired. Parties shall promptly advise the clerk of the court of any change in the information previously supplied to the court. F. Forms. 
the Indiana Office of Judicial Administration IOYA, shall prepare and publish a standard format for compliance with the provisions of this rule. G. Service. The clerk of the court shall use the information set forth in the appearance form for service by mail, fax, and email under Trial Rule 5. B. H. Withdrawal of representation. An attorney representing a party may file a motion to withdraw representation of the party upon a showing that the attorney has sent written notice of intent to withdraw to the party at least 10, 10 days before filing a motion to withdraw representation, and either 1. The terms and conditions of the attorney's agreement with the party regarding the scope of the representation have been satisfied, or 2. Withdrawal is required by Professional Conduct Rule 1.16a, or is otherwise permitted by Professional Conduct Rule 1.16b. An attorney filing a motion to withdraw from representation shall certify the last known address and telephone number of the party, subject to the confidentiality provisions of Sections A8 and D above and shall attach to the motion a copy of the notice of intent to withdraw that was sent to the party. A motion for withdrawal of representation shall be granted by the court unless the court specifically finds that withdrawal is not reasonable or consistent with the efficient administration of justice. I. Temporary or limited representation. If an attorney seeks to represent a party in a proceeding before the court on a temporary basis or a basis that is limited in scope, the attorney shall file a notice of temporary or limited representation. The notice shall contain the information set out in Section A. 1 and 2 above and a description of the temporary or limited status including the date the temporary status ends or the scope of the limited representation. The court shall not be required to examine the temporary or limited representation. At the completion of the temporary or limited representation, T. The attorney shall file a notice of completion of representation with the clerk of the court. Rule 4. Process. A. Jurisdiction over parties or persons in general. The court acquires jurisdiction over a party or person who under these rules commences or joins in the action, is served with summons or enters an appearance, or who is subjected to the power of the court under any other law. b. Preparation of summons and press o. b. Contemporaneously with the filing of the complaint or equivalent pleading. The person seeking service or his attorney shall furnish to the clerk as many copies of the complaint and summons as are necessary. The clerk shall examine, date, sign, and affix his seal to the summons and thereupon issue and deliver the papers to the appropriate person for service, affidavits, requests, and any other information relating to the summons and its service as required or permitted by these rules shall be included in a precipice attached to or entered upon the summons. Such precipice shall be deemed to be a part of the summons for purposes of these rules. Separate or additional summons shall, as provided by these rules, be issued by the clerk at any time upon proper request of the person seeking service or his attorney. C. Form of summons. The summons shall contain 1. The name and address of the person on whom the service is to be effected. 2. The name, street address, and telephone number of the court and the cause number assigned to the case. 3. The title of the case is shown by the complaint, but, if there are multiple parties, the title may be shortened to include only the first name plaintiff and defendant with an appropriate indication that there are additional parties. 4. The name, address, and telephone number of the attorney for the person seeking service. 5. The time within which these rules require the person being served to respond, and a clear statement that in case of his failure to do so, Judgment by default may be rendered against him for the relief demanded in the complaint.
The summons may also contain any additional information which will facilitate proper service. D. Designation of manner of service. The person seeking service or his attorney may designate the manner of service upon the summons. If not so designated, the clerk shall cause service to be made by mail or other public means provided the mailing address of the person to be served is indicated in the summons or can be determined. If a mailing address is not furnished or cannot be determined or if service by mail or other public means is returned without acceptance, t he complaint and summons shall promptly be delivered to the sheriff or his deputy who, unless otherwise directed, shall serve the summons. e summons and complaint served together exceptions. The summons and complaint shall be served together unless otherwise ordered by the court. When service of summons is made by publication, the complaint shall not be published. When jurisdiction over a party is dependent upon service of process by publication or by his appearance, summons and complaint shall be deemed to have been served at the end of the day of last required publication in the case of service by publication, and at the time of appearance and jurisdiction acquired by appearance. Whenever the summons and complaint are not served or published together, the summons shall contain the full, unabbreviated title of the case. F. Limits of effective service. Process may be served anywhere within the state and outside the state as provided in these rules. Rule 4.1. Summons, service on individuals. A. In general. Service may be made up o in an individual, or an individual acting in a representative capacity, by 1. Sending a copy of the summons and complaint by registered or certified mail or other public means by which a written acknowledgement of receipt may be requested and obtained to his residence. Place of business or employment with return receipt requested and returned showing receipt of the letter, or 2. Delivering a copy of the summons and complaint to him personally, or 3. Leaving a copy of the summons and complaint at his dwelling house or usual place of abode, or 4. Serving his agent as provided by rule, statute or valid agreement. b. Copy service to be followed with mail. Whenever service is made under Clause 3 or 4 of Subdivision A. The person making the service also shall send by first-class mail a copy of the summons and the complaint to the last known address of the person being served, and this fact shall be shown upon the return. Rule 4.2 Summons, Service upon Infant or Incompetence A. Service upon Infants Service upon an individual known to be an infant shall be made upon his next friend or guardian ad litem, if service is with respect to the same action in which the infant is so represented. If there is no next friend or guardian ad litem, service shall be made upon his court-appointed representative if one is known and can be served within the state. If there is no court-appointed representative, Service shall be made upon either parent known to have custody of the infant, or if there is no parent, upon a person known to be standing in the position of custodian or parent. The infant shall also be served if he is 14, 14 years of age or older. In the event that service, as provided above, is not possible, service shall be made on the infant. B. Service upon incompetence. Service upon an individual who has been adjudged to be of unsound mind, otherwise incompetent, or who is believed to be such shall be made upon his next friend or guardian ad litem, if service is with respect to the same action in which the incompetent is so represented. If there is no next friend or guardian ad litem, Service shall be made upon his court-appointed representative if one is known and can be served within the state. If there is no court-appointed representative, 
than upon the named party, and also upon a person known to be standing in the position of custodian of his person. c. Duty to inform court appearance. Nothing herein is intended to affect the duty of a party to inform the court that a person is an infant or incompetent. An appearance by a court-appointed guardian, next friend or guardian ad litem or his attorney shall correct any defect in service under this section unless such defect be challenged. Rule 4.3. Summons, service upon institutionalized persons. Service of summons upon a person who is imprisoned or restrained in an institution shall be made by delivering or mailing a copy of the summons and complaint to the official in charge of the institution. It shall be the duty of said official to immediately deliver the summons and complaint to the person being served and allow him to make provisions for adequate representation by counsel. The official shall indicate upon the return whether the person has received the summons and been allowed an opportunity to retain counsel. Rule 4.4. Service upon persons and actions for acts done in the state or having an effect in the state. A. Acts serving as a basis for jurisdiction. Any person or organization that is a non-resident of this state, a resident of this state who has left the state, or a person whose residence is unknown, submits to the jurisdiction of the courts of this state as to any action arising from the following acts committed by him or her or his or her agent. 1. Doing any business in the state. 2. Causing personal injury or property damage by an act or omission done within the state. 3. Causing personal injury or property damage in the state by an occurrence act or omission done outside this state if he regularly does or solicits business or engages in any other persistent course of conduct or derives substantial revenue or benefit from goods, materials, or services used, consumed, or rendered in the state. 4. Having supplied or contracted to supply services rendered or to be rendered or goods or materials furnished or to be furnished in this state. 5. Owning, using, or possessing any real property or an interest in real property within the state. 6. Contracting to insure or act as surety for or on behalf of any person, property or risk located within the state at the time the contract was made. 7. Living in the marital relationship within the state notwithstanding subsequent departure from the state, as to all obligations for alimony custody, child support, or property settlement. If the other party to the marital relationship continues to reside in the state, or 8. Abusing, harassing, or disturbing the peace of, or violating a protective or restraining order for the protection of, any person within the state by an act or omission done in this state, or outside this state if the act or omission is part of a continuing course of conduct having an effect in the state. In addition, a court of this state may exercise jurisdiction on any basis not inconsistent with the constitutions of this state or the United States. b. Manner of service. A person subject to the jurisdiction of the courts of this state under this rule may be served with summons. 1. As provided by Rules 4.1, Service on Individuals, 4.5, Service upon Resident, who cannot be found or served within the state, 4.6, Service upon Organizations, 4.9, In Rem Actions, or 2. The person shall be deemed to have appointed the Secretary of State as his agent upon whom service of summons may be made as provided in Rule 4.10. c. More convenient forum. Jurisdiction under this rule is subject to the power of the court to order the litigation to be held elsewhere under such reasonable conditions as the court in its discretion may determine to be just. In the exercise of that discretion the court may appropriately consider such factors as 
1. Amenability to personal jurisdiction in this state and in any alternative forum of the parties to the action. 2. Convenience to the parties and witnesses of the trial in this state in any alternative forum. 3. Differences in conflict of law rules applicable in this state and in the alternative forum. Or 4. Any other factors having substantial bearing upon the selection of a convenient, reasonable and fair place of trial. d. Forum non-convenience stay or dismissal. No stay or dismissal shall be granted due to a finding of forum non-convenience until all properly joined defendants file with the clerk of the court a written stipulation that each defendant will 1. Submit to the personal jurisdiction of the courts of the other forum, and 2. Waive any defense based on the statute of limitations applicable in the other forum with respect to all causes of action brought by a party to which this subsection applies. e. Order on forum non-convenience modification. The court may, on motion and notice to the parties, Modify an order granting a stay or dismissal under this subsection and take any further action in the proceeding as the interests of justice may require. If the moving party violates a stipulation required by subsection D, the court shall withdraw the order staying or dismissing the action and proceed as if the order had never been issued. Notwithstanding any other law. The court shall have continuing jurisdiction for the purposes of this subsection. Rule 4.5. Summons, service upon resident who cannot be found or served within the state. When the person to be served is a resident of this state who cannot be served personally or by agent in this state and either cannot be found, has concealed his whereabouts or has left the state, Summons may be served in the manner provided by Rule 4.9, Summons and in REM actions. Rule 4.6. Service upon organizations. A persons to be served. Service upon an organization may be made as follows. 1. In the case of a domestic or foreign organization upon an executive officer thereof or if there is an agent appointed or deemed by law to have been appointed to receive service, then upon such agent. 2. In the case of a partnership, upon a general partner thereof. 3. In the case of a state governmental organization upon the executive officer thereof and also upon the attorney general. 4. In the case of a local governmental organization upon the executive thereof and upon the attorney for the local governmental organization. 5. 1. In subsections 3 and 4 of this subdivision, a governmental representative is named as a party in his individual name or in such name along with his official title, then also upon such representative. b. Manner of service. Service under subdivision A of this rule shall be made on the proper person in the manner provided by these rules for service upon individuals. But a person seeking service or his attorney shall not knowingly direct service to be made at the person's dwelling house or place of abode, unless such is an address furnished under the requirements of a statute or valid agreement or unless an affidavit on or attached to the summons states that service in another manner is impractical. c. Service at organization's office. When shown upon an affidavit or in the return, that service upon an organization cannot be made as provided in subdivision a or b of this rule. Service may be made by leaving a copy of the summons and complaint at any office of such organization located within the state with the person in charge of such office. Rule 4.7. Summons, service upon agent named by statute or agreement. Whenever an agent other than an agent appointed to receive service for a governmental organization of this state has been designated by or pursuant to statute or valid agreement to receive service for the person being served, service may be made upon such agent as follows.
1. If the agent is a governmental organization or officer designated by or pursuant to statute, service shall be made as provided in Rule 4.10. 2. If the agent is one other than that described above, service shall be made upon him as provided in Rule 4.1. Service upon individuals or 4.6 service upon organizations. If service cannot be made upon such agent, because there is no address furnished as required by statute or valid agreement, or his whereabouts in the state are unknown, then his principal shall be deemed to have appointed the Secretary of State as a replacement for the agent and service may be made upon the Secretary of State as provided in Rule 4.10. Rule 4.8. Summons, service of pleadings or summons on Attorney General. Service of a copy of the summons and complaint or any pleading upon the Attorney General under these rules or any statute shall be made by personal service upon him, a deputy or clerk at his office, or by mail or other public means to him at such office in the manner provided by Rule 4.1 a 1 and by Rule 4.11 to the extent applicable. Rule 4.9. Summons in REM actions. A. In general. In any action involving arrests situated within the state, service may be made as provided in this rule. The court may render a judgment or decree to the extent of its jurisdiction over the rest. B. Manner of service. Service under this rule may be made as follows. 1. By service of summons upon a person or his agent pursuant to these rules, or 2. By service of summons outside this state in a manner provided by Rule 4. 1. Service upon individuals, or by publication outside this state in a manner provided by Rule 4.13. Service by publication, or outside this state in any other manner as provided by these rules, or 3. By service by publication pursuant to Rule 4.13. Rule 4.10. Summons, service upon Secretary of State or other governmental agent. AFN1. In general. Whenever, under these rules or any statute, service is made upon the Secretary of State or any other governmental organization or officer, as agent for the person being served, Service may be made upon such agent as provided in this rule. 1. The person seeking service or his attorney shall a. Uh, submit his request for service upon the agent in the precipi for summons, and state that the governmental organization or officer is the agent of the person being served. b. State the address of the person being served as filed and recorded pursuant to a statute or valid agreement or if no such address is known, then his last known mailing address, and, if no such address is known, then such shall be stated. c. Pay any fee prescribed by statute to be forwarded together with sufficient copies of the summons, affidavit and complaint, to the agent by the clerk of the court. 2. Upon receipt thereof the agent shall promptly a. Uh, send to the person being served a copy of the summons and complaint by registered or certified mail or by other public means by which a written acknowledgement of receipt may be obtained. b. Complete and deliver to the clerk an affidavit showing the date of the mailing, or if there was no mailing, the reason therefore. c. Send to the clerk a copy of the return receipt along with a copy of the summons, D. File and retain a copy of the return receipt. FN1. This rule contains no subbed. B. Rule 4.11. Summons, registered or certified mail. Whenever service by registered or certified mail or other public means by which a return receipt may be requested is authorized, the clerk of the court or governmental agent under Rule 4. 10 shall send the summons and complaint to the person being served at the address supplied upon the summons, 
or were furnished by the person seeking service. In his return the clerk of the court or the governmental agent shall show the date and place of mailing. A copy of the mailed or electronically transmitted return receipt if and when received by him showing whether the mailing was accepted or returned, and, if accepted, by whom. The return along with the receipt shall be promptly filed by the clerk with the pleadings and become a part of the record. If a mailing by the clerk of the court is returned without acceptance, the clerk shall reissue the summons and complaint for service as requested by the person seeking service. Rule 4.12 Summons, service by sheriff or other officer. A. In general. Whenever service is made by delivering a copy to a person personally or by leaving a copy at his dwelling house or place of employment as provided by Rule 4. 1. Summons shall be issued to and served by the sheriff, his deputy, or some person specially or regularly appointed by the court for that purpose. Service shall be effective if made by a person not otherwise authorized by these rules but proof of service by such a person must be made by him as a witness or by deposition without allowance of expenses therefore as costs. The person to whom the summons is delivered for service must act promptly and exercise reasonable care to cause service to be made. b. Special service by police officers. A sheriff, his deputy, or any full-time state or municipal police officer may serve summons in any county of the state if he agrees or has agreed to make the service. When specially requested in the precipi for summons, the complaint and summons shall be delivered to such officer by the clerk or the attorney for the person seeking service. No agreement with the sheriff or his deputy for such service in the sheriff's own county shall be permitted. In no event shall any expenses agreed upon under this provision be assessed or recovered as costs or affect court costs otherwise imposed for regular service. c. Service in other counties. A summons may be served in any county in this state. If service is to be made in another county, the summons may be issued by the clerk for service therein to the sheriff of such county or to a person authorized to make service by these rules. d. Service outside the state. Personal service, when permitted by these rules to be made outside the St. 8, may be made there by any disinterested person or by the attorney representing the person seeking such service. The expenses of such person may be assessed as costs only if they are reasonable and if service by mail or other public means cannot be made or is not successful. Rule 4.13 Summons, Service by Publication A Precipe for Summons by Publication In any action where notice by publication is permitted by these rules or by statute, service may be made by publication. Summons by publication may name all the persons to be served, and separate publications with respect to each party shall not be required. The person seeking such service, or his attorney, shall submit his request therefore upon the precipi for summons along with supporting affidavits of diligent search has been made that the defendant cannot be found, has concealed his whereabouts, or has left the state and shall prepare the contents of the summons to be published. The summons shall be signed by the clerk of the court or the sheriff in such manner as to indicate that it is made by his authority. b. Contents of summons by publication. The summons shall contain the following information. 1. The name of the person being sued, and the person to whom the notice is directed, and if the person's whereabouts are unknown or some or all of the parties are unknown, a statement to that effect. 2. The name of the court and cause number assigned to the case. 3. The title of the case is shown by the complaint, but if there are multiple parties. 
the title may be shortened to include only the first name plaintiff and those defendants to be served by publication with an appropriate indication that there are additional parties. 4. The name and address of the attorney representing the person seeking service. 5. A brief statement of the nature of the suit, which need not contain the details and particulars of the claim. A description of any property, relationship, or other rest involved in the action, and a statement that the person being sued claims some interest therein. 6. A clear statement that the person being sued must respond within 30, 30 days after the last notice of the action is published, and in case he fails to do so, judgment by default may be entered against him for the relief demanded in the complaint. c. Publication of summons. The summons shall be published three, three times by the clerk or person making it. The first publication promptly and each two, two, succeeding publications at least seven, seven, and not more than fourteen, fourteen, days after the prior publication. In a newspaper authorized by law to publish notices, and published in the county where the complaint or action is filed, where the rest is located, or where the defendant resides, or where he was no last to reside. If no newspaper is published in the county, then the summons shall be published in the county in the state nearest thereto in which any such paper may be printed, or in a place specially ordered by the court. The person seeking the service or his attorney may designate any qualified newspaper, and if he fails to do so, the selection may be made by the clerk. d. By whom made or procured. Service of summons by publication shall be made and procured by the clerk, by a person appointed by the court for that purpose, or by the clerk or sheriff of another county where publication is to be made. e. Return. The clerk or person making the service shall prepare the return and include the following. 1. Any supporting affidavits of the printer containing a copy of the summons which was published. 2. An information or statement that the newspaper and the publication meet all legal requirements applicable to such publication. 3. The dates of publication. The return and affidavits shall be filed with the pleadings and other papers in the case and shall become a part of the record as provided in these rules. Rule 4.14. Service under special order of court. Upon application of any party the court in which any action is pending may make an appropriate order for service in a manner not provided by these rules or statutes when such service is reasonably calculated to give the defendant actual knowledge of the proceedings and an opportunity to be heard. Rule 4.15 Summons, Proof of Service Return Amendments Defects A Return Form the person making service shall promptly make his return upon or attach it to a copy of the summons which shall be delivered to the clerk. The return shall be signed by the person making it, and shall include a statement. 1. That service was made upon the person as required by law and the time, place, and manner thereof. 2. If service was not made, the particular manner in which it was thwarted in terms of fact or in terms of law. 3. Such other information as is expressly required by these rules. b. Return and affidavits as evidence. The return, along with the summons to which it is attached or is a part, the precipi for summons, affidavits furnished with the summons or precipi for summons, and all other affidavits permitted by these rules shall be filed by the clerk with the pleadings and other papers in the case and thereupon shall become a part of the record, and have such evidentiary effect as is now provided by law. Copies of such records shall be admissible in all actions and proceedings and may be entered in any public records when certified over the signature of the clerk or his deputy and the clerk's seal c. Proof of filing and issuance dates. The clerk shall enter a filing date upon every precipice, 
pleading, return, summons, affidavit or other paper filed with or entered of record by him. The clerk shall also enter an issuance date upon any summons issued, mailed or delivered by him, or other communication served or transmitted by him under these rules. Such filing or issuance date shall constitute evidence of the date of filing or issuance without further authentication when entered in the court records, or when the paper or a copy thereof is otherwise properly offered or admitted into evidence. D. Admission of service. A written admission stating the date and place of service, signed by the person being served, may be filed with the clerk who shall file it with the pleadings. Such admission shall become a part of the record, constitute evidence of proper service, and shall be allowed as evidence in any action or proceeding. E. Amendment. At any time in its discretion and upon such terms as it deems just, the court may allow any process or proof of service thereof to be amended unless it clearly appears that material prejudice would result to the substantial rights of the person against whom the process is issued. F. Defects and summons. No summons or the service T hereof shall be set aside or be adjudged insufficient when either is reasonably calculated to inform the person to be served that an action has been instituted against him, the name of the court, and the time within which he is required to respond. Rule 4.16. Summons, Duties of Persons to Aid in Service. A. It shall be the duty of every person being served under these rules to cooperate, accept service, comply with the provisions of these rules, and, when service is made upon him personally, acknowledge receipt of the papers and writing over his signature. 1. Offering or tendering the papers to the person being served and advising the person that he or she is being served is adequate service. 2. A person who has refused to accept the offer or tender of the papers being served thereafter may not challenge the service of those papers. b. Anyone accepting service for another person is under a duty to 1. Promptly deliver the papers to that person. 2. Promptly notify that person that he holds the papers for him. Or 3. Within a reasonable time. In writing, notify the clerk or person making the service that he has been unable to make such delivery of notice when such is the case. C. No person through whom service is made under these rules may impose any sanction, penalty, punishment, or discrimination whatsoever against the person being served because of such service. Any person willfully violating any provision of this rule may be subjected to contempt proceedings. Rule 4.17. Summons, certain proceedings accepted. Rules 4 through 4.16 shall not replace the manner of serving summons or giving notices specially provided by statute or rule and proceedings involving, without limitation, the administration of decedents or states guardianships, receiverships, or assignments for the benefit of creditors. Rule 5. Service and filing of pleading and other papers. A. Service, when required. Unless otherwise provided by these rules or an order of the court, each party and special judge, if any, shall be served with 1. Every order required by its terms to be served. 2. Every pleading subsequent to the original complaint. 3. Every written motion except one which may be heard ex part. 4. Every brief submitted to the trial court. 5. Every paper relating to discovery required to be served upon a party. And 6. Every written notice, appearance, demand, offer of judgment designation of record on appeal, or similar paper. No service need be made on parties in default for failure to appear, 
except that pleadings asserting new or additional claims for relief against them shall be served upon them in the manner provided by service of summons and rule 4. b. Service, how made. Whenever a party is represented by an attorney of record, service shall be made upon such attorney unless service upon the party is ordered by the court. Service upon the attorney or party shall be made by delivering or mailing a copy of the papers to the last known address, or where service is by fax or email. By faxing or emailing a copy of the documents to the fax number or email address set out in the appearance form or correction as required by Rule 3.1e. 1. Delivery. Delivery of a copy within this rule means a. Uh, offering or tendering it to the attorney or party and stating the nature of the papers being served. Refusal to accept an offered or tendered document is a waiver of any objection to the sufficiency or adequacy of service of that document. b. Leaving it at his office with a clerk or other person in charge thereof, or if there is no one in charge, leaving it in a conspicuous place therein, or c. If the office is closed, by leaving it at his dwelling house or usual place of abode with some person of suitable age and discretion then residing therein, or d. Leaving it at some other suitable place, selected by the attorney upon whom service is being made, pursuant to duly promulgated local rule. 2. Service by mail. If service is made by mail, the papers shall be deposited in the United States mail address to the person on whom they are being served, with postage prepaid. Service shall be deemed complete upon mailing. Proof of service of all papers permitted to be mailed may be made by written acknowledgement of service, by affidavit of the person who mailed the papers, or by certificate of an attorney. It shall be the duty of attorneys when entering their appearance in a cause or when filing pleadings or papers therein to have noted in the chronological case summary or said pleadings or papers so filed the address and telephone number of their office. Service by delivery or by mail at such address shall be deemed sufficient and complete. 3. Service by fax or email. A. Uh, service by email from the clerk. The clerk may transmit notice of all rulings, orders, or judgments required by Trial Rule 72 D. by email to all parties represented by attorneys and to all unrepresented parties who have supplied the court with an email address for service. Where a copy of a written ruling, order, or judgment is being transmitted by email, Service may be made by including a link to the document or by attaching the document being served to the email in PDF format. b. Service by fax or email from other parties. A party who has consented to service by fax or email may be served by attaching the document being served to an email in PDF format. Discovery documents must also be served in accordance with Trial Rule 26A. C. Completion of service by fax or email. Service by fax or email shall be deemed complete upon transmission. Service that occurs on a Saturday, Sunday, a legal holiday, or a day the court or agency in which the matter is pending is closed, or after 5 o'clock p. m. Local time of the recipient shall be deemed complete the next day that is not a Saturday, Sunday, a legal holiday, or a day the court or agency in which the matter is pending is not closed. C. Certificate of Service. An attorney or unrepresented party tendering a document to the clerk for filing shall certify that service has been made, list the parties served, and specify the date and means of service. The certificate of service shall be placed at the end of the document and shall not be separately filed. The separate filing of a certificate of service, however, shall not be grounds for rejecting a document for filing. 
The clerk may permit documents to be filed without a certificate of service, but shall require prompt filing of a separate certificate of service. D. Same. Numerous defendants. In any action in which there are unusually large numbers of defendants, the court, upon motion or of its own initiative, may order. 1. That service of the pleadings of the defendants and replies thereto need not be made as between the defendants. 2. That any cross-claim, counterclaim, or matter constituting an avoidance or affirmative defense contained therein shall be deemed to be denied or avoided by all other parties. And 3. That the filing of any such pleading and service thereof upon the plaintiff constitutes due notice of it to the parties. A copy of every such order shall be served upon the parties in such manner and form as the court directs. E. Filing 1. Except as otherwise provided in subparagraph 2. Hereof All pleadings and papers subsequent to the complaint which are required to be served upon a party shall be filed with the court either before service or within a reasonable period of time thereafter. 2. No deposition or request for discovery or response thereto under Trial Rules 27, 30, 31, 33, 34 or 36 shall be filed with the court unless a. A motion is filed pursuant to Trial Rule 26 C or Trial Rule 37 and the original deposition or request for discovery or response thereto is necessary to enable the court to rule. Or b. A party desires to use the deposition or request for discovery or response thereto for evidentiary purposes at trial or in connection with a motion, and the court, either upon its own motion or that of any party, or as a part of any pre-trial order, orders the filing of the original. 3. Custody of original and period of retention. a. Uh, the original of a deposition shall subject to the provisions of Trial Rule 30 e. be delivered by the reporter to the party taking it and shall be maintained by that party until filed with the court pursuant to paragraph 2 or until the later of final judgment. Agreed settlement of the litigation or all appellate rights have been exhausted b. The original or any request for discovery or response thereto under Trial Rules 27, 30 31, 33, 34 and 36 shall be maintained by the party originating the request or response until filed with the court pursuant to paragraph 2 or until the later of final judgment, agreed settlement or all appellate rights have been exhausted. 4. In the event it is made to appear to the satisfaction of the court that the original of a deposition or request for discovery or response thereto cannot be filed with the court when required, the court may allow use of a copy instead of the original. 5. The filing of any deposition shall constitute publication. f. Filing with the court defined. The filing of pleadings, motions and other papers with the court as required by these rules shall be made by one of the following methods. 1. Delivery to the clerk of the court. 2. Sending by electronic transmission under the procedure adopted pursuant to Administrative Rule 12. 4. Depositing with any third-party commercial carrier for delivery to the clerk within 3. 3. Calendar days. Cost prepaid properly addressed. 5. If the court so permits, filing with the judge, in which event the judge shall note their on filing date and forthwith transmit them to the office of the clerk. Or 6. Electronic filing, as approved by the Indiana Office of Judicial Administration, IOIA, pursuant to Trial Rule 86. Filing by registered or certified mail and by third-party commercial carrier shall be complete upon mailing or deposit. Any party filing any paper by any method other than personal delivery to the clerk shall retain proof of filing. G. Confidentiality of court records.
1. Court records are accessible to the public, except as provided in the rules on access to court records. 2. Any court record excluded from public access pursuant to the rules on access to court records must be filed in accordance with Rule 7 of the Rules on Access to Court Records. H. Distribution of Orders 1. Unless otherwise provided by statute or these rules, the clerk shall distribute signed orders to non-defaulting parties for whom an email address has not been provided. 2. All orders and trial rule 69 proceedings supplemental, execution, and foreclosure sales shall be distributed for service by the party who submitted the proposed order. Rule 6. Time. A computation. In computing any period of time prescribed or allowed by these rules, by order of the court, or by any applicable statute, the day of the act, event, or default from which the designated period of time begins to run shall not be included. The last day of the period so computed is to be included unless it is 1. A Saturday 2. A Sunday 3. A legal holiday as defined by state statute, or 4. A day the office in which the act is to be done is closed during regular business hours. In any event, the period runs until the end of the next day that is not a Saturday, a Sunday, a legal holiday, or a day on which the office is closed. When the period of time allowed is less than seven, seven days, intermediate Saturdays, Sundays, legal holidays, and days on which the office is closed shall be excluded from the computations. B. Enlargement. When an act is required or allowed to be done at or within a specific time by these rules, the court may at any time for cause shown. 1. Order the period enlarged, with or without motion or notice, if request therefore is made before the expiration of the period originally prescribed or extended by a previous order, or 2. Upon motion made after the expiration of this specific period, Permit the act to be done where the failure to act was the result of excusable neglect. But the court may not extend the time for taking any action for judgment on the evidence under Rule 50 A, Amendment of Findings and Judgment under Rule 52 B, to correct errors under Rule 59 C, Statement in Opposition to Motion to Correct Error under Rule 59 E, or to obtain relief from final judgment under Rule 60 b, except to the extent and under the conditions stated in those rules. c. Service of pleadings in Rule 12 motions. A response of pleading required under these rules, shall be served within 20, 20 days after service of the prior pleading. Unless the court specifies otherwise, a reply shall be served within 20, 20 days after entry of an order requiring it. The service of a motion permitted under Rule 12 alters the time for service of responsive pleadings as follows, unless a different time is fixed by the court. 1. If the court does not grant the motion, the responsive pleading shall be served in 10, 10 days after notice of the court's action. 2. If the court grants the motion and the corrective action is allowed to be taken, it shall be taken within 10, 10 days, and the response of pleading shall be served within 10, 10 days thereafter. d. For motions affidavits. A written motion, other than one which may be heard ex part, a empty notice of the hearing thereof shall be served not less than five, five days before the time specified for the hearing. Unless a different period is fixed by these rules or by order of the court. Such an order may, for cause shown, be made on ex parte application. When a motion is supported by affidavit, the affidavit shall be served with the motion. And except as otherwise provided in Rule 59 d, 
Opposing affidavits may be served not less than one, one day before the hearing, unless the court permits them to be served at some other time. E. Additional time after service by United States mail. Whenever a party has the right or is required to do some act or take some proceedings within a prescribed period after the service of a notice or other paper upon them and the notice or paper is served upon them by United States mail, three, three days shall be added to the prescribed period. F. Dissolution Action 60-Day Waiting Period no cause for dissolution of marriage or for legal separation shall be tried or heard by any court until after the expiration of 60, 60 days from the date of the filing of the petition or from the date of the publication of the first notice to a non-resident. Rule 7. Pleadings allowed form of motion. A. Pleadings. The pleadings shall consist of 1. A complaint and an answer. 2. A reply to a denominated counterclaim. 3. An answer to a cross-claim. 4. A third-party complaint, if a person not an original party is summoned under the provisions of Rule 14, and 5. A third-party answer. No other pleadings shall be allowed, but the court may, in its discretion, Order a reply to an answer or third party answer. Matters formally required to be pleaded by a reply or other subsequent pleading may be proved even though they are not pleaded. b. Motions and other papers. Unless made during a hearing or trial, or otherwise ordered by the court, an application to the court for an order shall be made by written motion. The motion shall state the grounds therefore and the relief or order sought. The requirement of notice is satisfied by service of the motion. C. Demurrers, please, etc., abolished. Demurrers, pleas and abatement, and exceptions for insufficiency of a pleading or improper service shall not be used. All objections and offenses formerly raised by such motions shall now be raised pursuant to Rule 12. Rule 8. General Rules of Pleading. A. Claims for Relief. To state a claim for relief, whether an original claim, counterclaim, cross-claim, or third-party claim, a pleading must contain. 1. A short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief, and 2. A demand for relief to which the pleader deems entitled. Relief in the alternative or of several different types may be demanded. However, in any complaint seeking damages for personal injury or death, or seeking punitive damages, no dollar amount or figure shall be included in the demand. B. Defenses, form of denials. A response of pleading shall state in short and plain terms the pleader's defenses to each claim asserted and shall admit or controvert the averments set forth in the preceding pleading. If in good faith the pleader intends to deny all the averments in the preceding pleading, he may do so by general denial subject to the provisions of Rule 11. If he does not intend a general denial, he may 1. Specifically deny designated averments or paragraphs, or 2. Generally deny all averments except such designated averments and paragraphs as he expressly admits. If he lacks knowledge or information sufficient to form a belief as to the truth of an averment, he shall so state and his statement shall be considered a denial. If in good faith a pleader intends to deny only a part or a qualification of an averment, he shall specify so much of it as is true in D material and deny the remainder. All denials shall fairly meet the substance of the averments denied. This rule shall have no application to uncontested actions for divorce, or to answers required to be filed by clerks or guardians ad litem. C. Affirmative Defenses. 
a response of pleading shall set forth affirmatively and carry the burden of proving accord and satisfaction, arbitration and award, discharge in bankruptcy, duress, estoppel, failure of consideration, fraud, illegality, injury by fellow servant, lacquers, license, payment, release, res judicata, statute of frauds, statute of limitations, waiver, lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, lack of jurisdiction over the person, improper venue, insufficiency of process or service of process, the same action pending in another state court of this state, and any other matter constituting an avoidance, matter of abatement, or affirmative defense. A party required to affirmatively plead any matters, including matters formally required to be pleaded affirmatively by reply, shall have the burden of proving such matters. The burden of proof imposed by this or any other provision of these rules is subject to the rules of evidence or any statute fixing a different rule. If the pleading mistakenly designates a defense as a counterclaim or a counterclaim as a defense, the court shall treat the pleading as if there had been a proper designation. D. Effect of failure to deny. Avermints in a pleading to which a response of pleading is required, except those pertaining to amount of damages, are admitted when not denied in the response of pleading. Averments in a pleading to which no response of pleading is required or permitted shall be taken as denied or avoided. e. All pleadings to be concise and direct consistency. 1. Each averment of a pleading shall be simple, concise, and direct. No technical forms of pleading or motions are required. All fictions in pleading are abolished. 2. A pleading may set forth two, two, or more statements of a claim or defense alternatively or hypothetically, either in one, one, count or defense or in separate counts or defenses. When two, two, or more statements are made in the alternative and one, one, of them if made independently would be sufficient, the pleading is not made insufficient by the insufficiency of one, or more of the alternative statements. A pleading may also state as many separate claims or defenses as the pleader has regardless of consistency and whether based on legal or equitable grounds. All statements shall be made as you object to the obligations set forth in Rule 11. 3. Motions and pleadings, joined in several. All motions and pleadings of any kind addressed to two, two, or more paragraphs of any pleading or filed by two, two, or more parties, shall be taken and construed as joint, separate, and several motions or pleadings to each of such paragraphs and by and against each of such parties. All motions or pleadings containing two, two, or more subject matters shall be taken and construed as separate and several as to each subject matter. All objections to rulings made by two, two, or more parties shall be taken and construed as the joint, separate, and several objections of each of such parties. A complaint filed by or against two, two, or more plaintiffs shall be taken and construed as joint, separate, and several as to each of said plaintiffs. F. Construction of Pleadings all pleadings shall be so construed as to do substantial justice, lead to disposition on the merits, and avoid litigation of procedural points. Rule 9. Pleading Special Matters A. Capacity. It is not necessary to aver the capacity of a party to sue or be sued, the authority of a party to sue or be sued in a representative capacity or the legal existence of an organization that is made a party. The burden of proving lack of such capacity, authority, or legal existence shall be upon the person asserting lack of it, and shall be pleaded as an affirmative defense. b. Fraud, mistake, condition of the mind. In all averments of fraud or mistake, 
the circumstances constituting fraud or mistake shall be specifically averred. Malice, intent, knowledge, and other conditions of mind may be averred generally. C. Conditions precedent. In pleading the performance or occurrence of promissory or non-promissory conditions precedent, it is sufficient to waver generally that all conditions precedent have been performed, have occurred, or have been excused. A denial of performance or occurrence shall be made specifically and with particularity, and a denial of excuse generally. D. Official Document or Act in pleading an official document or official act it is sufficient to waver that the document was issued or the act done in compliance with law. E. Judgment. In pleading a judgment or decision of a domestic or foreign court, judicial or quasi-judicial tribunal, or of a board or officer, it is sufficient to waver the judgment or decision without setting forth matter showing jurisdiction to render it. F. Time and place. For the purpose of testing the sufficiency of a pleading, averments of time and place are material and shall be considered like all other averments of material matter. However, time and place need be stated only with such specificity as will enable the opposing party to prepare his defense. G. Special damages damages where no answer. When items of special damage are claimed, they shall be specifically stated. The relief granted to the plaintiff, if there be no answer, cannot exceed the relief demanded in his complaint. But, in any other case, the court may grant him any relief consistent with the facts or matters pleaded. Rule 9.1 Pleading and proof of contributory negligence, assume risk, res liquitur, consideration, Bonafide purchaser, matters of judicial notice answer of distraint. A defense of contributory negligence or assumed risk. In all claims alleging negligence, the burden of pleading and proving contributory negligence, assumption of risk, or incurred risk shall be upon the defendant who may plead such by denial of the allegation. B. Recipes liquidator. Recipes liquidator or similar doctrine may be pleaded by alleging generally that the facts connected with the action are unknown to the pleader and are within the knowledge of the opposing party. C. Consideration. When an action or defense is founded upon a written contract or release, lack of consideration for the promise or release is an affirmative defense, and the party asserting lack of it carries the burden of proof. D. Bonafide Purchaser. When the rights of a person depend upon his status as a bona fide purchaser for value or upon similar requirements, such status must be pleaded and proved by the person asserting it, but it may be pleaded in general terms. Once it is established that the person has given any required value, unless such value is commercially unreasonable, and that he has met any requirements of recordation, filing, possession, or perfection. The trier of fact must find that such value was given or such perfection was made in accordance with any requirements of good faith, lack of knowledge, or lack of notice unless and until evidence is introduced which would support a finding of its non-existence. e. Presumption matters of judicial notice. Neither presumptions of law nor matters of which judicial notice may be taken need be stated in a pleading. F. Property distrained sufficient answer. In an action to recover the possession of property distrained while doing damage, an answer that the defendant, or person by whose command he acted, was lawfully possessed of the real property upon which the distress was made and that the property distrained was at the time doing damage thereon, shall be good without setting forth the title of such real property. Rule 9.2. Pleading and Proof of Written Instruments. A. When instrument or copy, or an affidavit of debt shall be filed. When any pleading allowed by these rules is founded on a written instrument, the original, or a copy thereof, 
shall be included in or filed with the pleading. Such instrument, whether copied in the pleadings or not, shall be taken as part of the record. Further, 1. If the claim A arises out of a written contract, a copy shall be attached. However, the fact that a copy of such contract is not in the custody of the plaintiff shall not bar the filing of the claim. Or B. Is on an account, an affidavit of debt, in a form substantially similar to Appendix A2 shall be attached. 2. In addition to the requirements set forth above in SU Section 1, if the plaintiff is not the original creditor, and the claim arises from a debt that is primarily for personal, family, or household purposes, the plaintiff shall provide an affidavit of debt that shall have attached as one or more exhibits which shall include a copy of the contract or other writing evidencing the original debt, which shall contain a signature of the defendant. If a claim is based on credit card or other debt and no such sign writing evidencing the original debt ever existed, then copies of documents generated when the debt was incurred or the credit card was actually used shall be attached. And b. A chronological listing of the names of all prior owners of the debt and the date of each transfer of ownership of the debt, beginning with the name of the original creditor. And c. A certified or other properly authenticated copy of the bill of sale or other document that transferred ownership of the debt to the plaintiff. b. Proof of execution of instruments filed with pleadings. When a pleading is founded on a written instrument and the instrument or a copy thereof is included in or filed with the pleading, execution of such instrument, endorsement, or assignment shall be deemed to be established and the instrument, if otherwise admissible, shall be deemed admitted into evidence and the action without proving its execution unless execution be denied under oath in the response of pleading or by an affidavit filed therewith. A denial asserting T hat another person who is not a party did execute the instrument, endorsement, or assignment may be made without such oath or affidavit only if the pleader alleges under oath or in an accompanying affidavit that after the exercise of reasonable diligence H E was unable to make such person or his representative subdivision. H. A party. The reason therefore and that he is without information as to such execution. c. Oath or affidavit of denial of execution must be made upon personal knowledge. An oath or affidavit denying execution as required and made under subdivision b of this rule shall be made upon the personal knowledge of the person making it, and, if general inform rule 11 b shall be deemed to be made upon such personal knowledge. d. Burden of proving execution. The ultimate burden of proving the execution of our written instrument is upon the party claiming its validity, but execution is presumed. Presumed means that the trier of fact must find the existence of the fact presumed unless and until evidence is introduced which would support a finding of its non-existence e. Inspection of the original instrument. When a copy of our written instrument is filed with or copied in the pleadings under the provisions of this rule, the pleader shall permit inspection of the original unless it is alleged that the original is lost, whether by destruction, theft or otherwise, or unless it is alleged or established that the instrument is in the possession of another person and out of the control of the pleader, or that the duty to allow inspection is otherwise excused. The pleader shall allow inspection promptly upon request of a party, and inspection may be ordered by the court upon motion without a hearing at any time. A party failing to comply with such request or such order shall be subject to the provisions of Rule 37 b. This provision shall not diminish a party's rights under Rules 26 through 38. f. Effect of non-compliance amendments. 
non-compliance with the provisions of this rule requiring a written instrument or an affidavit of debt to be included with the pleading may be raised by the first response of pleading or prior motion of a party. The court, in its sound discretion, may order compliance, the reasons for non-compliance to be added to the pleadings, or allow the action to continue without further pleading. Amendments to correct the omission of a required written instrument, an assignment or endorsement thereof, the omission of a denial of the execution of our written instrument as permitted or required by this rule, or an affidavit of debt shall be governed by Rule 15, except as provided by Subdivision A of this rule. G. Exceptions Infants, Incompetents, Dead and Insolvent Persons the requirement of this rule that execution of our written instrument be denied under oath or otherwise, shall not apply against a party who is not required to file a response of pleading, or against a party who, at the time the response of pleading is due or before the pleadings are closed, is or becomes dead, an infant or adjudicated incompetent, or is the representative of such person or of a person who is dead, an infant, an adjudicated incompetent, or in insolvency proceedings. Such parties shall be deemed to have denied execution or admissibility without any response of pleading or denial. The presumption of execution as provided in subdivision D of this rule shall not apply to establish execution of our written instrument by a person who, at the time proof is required, is dead an infant or adjudicated incompetent. H. Execution of our written instrument. Execution of our written instrument includes the following requirements. 1. That a signature was made with express, implied or apparent authority and was not forged. 2. That the instrument was properly delivered, including any requisite intent that it be effective. 3. That the written terms of the instrument have not been materially altered without the express, implied or apparent authority of the person bound thereon. 4. That the person seeking its enforcement is in possession of the instrument when required. And 5. That the names or identity of the persons named in the instrument are correct. I. Written instrument when pleading is founded thereon when pleading is not founded thereon term includes document s when a pleading is founded upon a written instrument any written endorsement or assignment of rights thereof upon which the pleader's title depends is included in the term written instrument rule 10 form of pleading a caption names of parties Every pleading shall contain a caption setting forth the name of the court, the title of the action, the file number, and a designation as in Rule 7a. In the complaint the title of the action shall include the names of all the parties, but in other pleadings it is sufficient to state the name of the first party on each side with an appropriate indication of other parties. b. Paragraphs separate statements. All averments of the claim or defense shall be made in numbered paragraphs, the contents of each of which shall be limited as far as practicable to a statement of a single set of circumstances. And a paragraph may be referred to by number in all succeeding pleadings. Each claim founded upon a separate transaction or occurrence and each defense other than denials may be stated in a separate count or defense whenever a separation facilitates the clear presentation of the matters set forth. c. Adoption by reference exhibits. Statements in a pleading may be adopted by reference in a different part of the same pleading or in another pleading or in any motion. A copy of any written instrument which is an exhibit to a pleading is a part thereof for all purposes. Rule 11. Signing and Verification of Pleadings. A parties represented by attorney. Every pleading or motion of a party represented by an attorney shall be signed by at least one, one attorney of record in his individual name, whose address, telephone number, 
an attorney number shall be stated. Except that this provision shall not apply to pleadings and motions made and transcribed at the trial or a hearing before the judge and received by him in such form. A party who is not represented by an attorney shall sign his pleading and state his address. Except when specifically required by rule, pleadings or motions need not be verified or accompanied by affidavit. The rule in equity that the averments of an answer under oath must be overcome by the testimony of two, two, witnesses or of one, one. Witness sustained by corroborating circumstances is abolished. The signature of an attorney constitutes a certificate by him that he has read the pleadings, that to the best of his knowledge, information, and belief, there is good ground to support it and that it is not interposed for delay. If a pleading or motion is not signed or is signed with intent to defeat the purpose of the rule, it may be stricken as sham and false and the action may proceed as though the pleading had not been served. For a willful violation of this rule an attorney may be subjected to appropriate disciplinary action. Similar action may be taken if scandalous or indecent matter is inserted b. Verification by affirmation or representation. When in connection with any civil or special statutory proceeding it is required that any pleading, motion, petition, supporting affidavit, or other document of any kind, be verified, or that an oath be taken. It shall be sufficient if the subscriber simply affirms the truth of the matter to be verified by an affirmation or representation in substantially the following language. I, we, affirm, under the penalties for perjury, that the foregoing representation, S, is, R, true. Signed. Any person who falsifies an affirmation or representation of fact shall be subject to the same penalties as are prescribed by law for the making of a false affidavit. C. Verified pleadings, motions, and affidavits as evidence. Pleadings. Motions and affidavits accompanying or in support of such pleadings or motions when required to be verified or under oath shall be accepted as a representation that the signer had personal knowledge thereof or reasonable cause to believe the existence of the facts or matters stated or alleged therein, and, if otherwise competent or acceptable as evidence, may be admitted as evidence of the facts or matters stated or alleged therein when it is so provided in these rules by statute or other law, or to the extent the writing or signature expressly purports to be made upon the signer's personal knowledge. When such pleadings, motions and affidavits are verified or under oath they shall not require other or greater proof on the part of the adverse party than if not verified or not under oath unless expressly provided otherwise by these rules statute or other law affidavits upon motions for summary judgment under rule 56 and in denial of execution under rule 9.2 shall be made upon personal knowledge rule 12 defenses and objections when and how presented by pleading or motion motion for judgment on the pleadings. A. When presented. The time allowed for the presentation of defenses and objections in a motion or response of pleading shall be computed pursuant to the provisions of Rule 6 C. B. How presented. Every defense, in law or fact, to a claim for relief in any pleading whether a claim, counterclaim, cross-claim, or third-party claim, shall be asserted in the response of pleading thereto if one is required. Except that at the option of the pleader, the following defenses may be made by motion. 1. Lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter. 2. Lack of jurisdiction over the person. 3. Incorrect venue under Trial Rule 75, or any statutory provision. The disposition of this motion shall be consistent with Trial Rule 75. 4. Insufficiency of process. 
5. Insufficiency of service of process. 6. Failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, which shall include failure to name the real party in interest under Rule 17. 7. Failure to join a party needed for just adjudication under Rule 19. 8. The same action pending in another state court of this state. A motion making any of these defenses shall be made before pleading if a further pleading is permitted or within 20, 20 days after service of the prior pleading if none is required. If a pleading sets forth a sea lame for relief to which the adverse party is not required to serve a response of pleading, any of the defenses in section B, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 8 is waived to the extent constitutionally permissible unless made in a motion within 20, 20 days after service of the prior pleading. No defense or objection is waived by being joined with one or more other defenses or objections in a response of pleading or motion. When a motion to dismiss is sustained for failure to state a claim under subdivision B6 of this rule the pleading may be amended once as of right pursuant to Rule 15A within 10, 10 days after service of notice of the court's order sustaining the motion and thereafter with permission of the court pursuant to such rule. If, on a motion, asserting the defense number 6, to dismiss for failure of the pleading to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, matters outside the pleading are presented to and not excluded by the court. The motion shall be treated as one for summary judgment and D disposed of as provided in Rule 56. In such case, all parties shall be given reasonable opportunity to present all material made pertinent to such a motion by Rule 56. C. Motion for judgment on the pleadings. After the pleadings are closed be it within a such time as not to delay the trial, any party may move for judgment on the pleadings. If, on a motion for judgment on the pleadings, matters outside the pleadings are presented to and not excluded by the court, the motion shall be treated as one for summary judgment and disposed of as provided in Rule 56 and all parties shall be given reasonable opportunity to present all material made pertinent to such a motion by Rule 56. d. Preliminary Determination Whether made in a pleading or by motion, the defense is specifically enumerated 1, 2, 8 in subdivision b of this rule, and the motion for judgment on the pleadings mentioned in subdivision c of this rule shall upon application of any party or by order of court, be determined before trial unless substantial justice requires the court to defer hearing until trial. e. Motion for a more definite statement. If a pleading to which a response of pleading is permitted is so vague or ambiguous that a party cannot reasonably be required to frame a response of pleading, he may move for a more definite statement before interposing his responsive pleading. The motion shall point out the defects complained of and the details desired. If the motion is granted and the order of the court is not obeyed within 20, 20 days after notice of the order or within such other time as the court may fix, the court may strike the pleading to which the motion was directed or make such order as it deems just. F. Motion to strike. Upon motion made by a party before responding to a pleading, or, if no response of pleading is permitted by these rules, upon motion made by a party within 20, 20 days after the service of the pleading upon him or at any time upon the court's own initiative, the court may order stricken from any pleading any insufficient claim or defense or any redundant a material impertinent, or scandalous matter. g. Consolidation of defenses and motion. A party who makes a motion under this rule may join with it any other motions herein provided for and then available to him. 
If a party makes a motion under this rule but omits therefrom any defense or objection then available to him which this rule permits to be raised by motion, he shall not thereafter make a motion based on the defense or objection so omitted. He may, however, make such motions as are allowed under subdivision H2 of this rule. H. Waiver or preservation of certain defenses. 1. A defense of lack of jurisdiction over the person, improper venue, insufficiency of process, insufficiency of service of process, or the same action pending in another state court of this state is waived to the extent constitutionally permissible. A. Uh, if omitted from a motion in the circumstances described in subdivision G. Comma. B. If it is neither made by motion under this rule nor included in a response of pleading or an amendment thereof permitted by Rule 15 A to be made as a matter of course. 2. A defense of failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, a defense of failure to join an indispensable party under Rule 19 B and an objection of failure to state a legal defense to a claim may be made in any pleading permitted or ordered under Rule 7a or by motion for judgment on the pleadings, or at the trial on the merits. Rule 13. Counterclaim and cross -cla. M. A. Compulsory counterclaims. A pleading shall state as a counterclaim any claim which at the time of serving the pleading the pleader has against any opposing party, if it arises out of the transaction or occurrence that I s the subject matter of the opposing party's claim and does not require for its adjudication the presence of third parties of whom the court cannot acquire jurisdiction. But the pleader need not state the claim if 1. At the time the action was commenced the claim was the subject of another pending action. Or 2. The opposing party brought suit upon his claim by attachment or other process by which the court did not acquire jurisdiction to render a personal judgment on that claim, and the pleader is not stating any counterclaim under this rule. b. Permissive counterclaims. A pleading may state as a counterclaim any claim against an opposing party not arising out of the transaction or occurrence that is the subject matter of the opposing party's claim. c. Counterclaim exceeding opposing claim. A counterclaim may or may not diminish or defeat the recovery sought by the opposing party. It may claim relief exceeding an amount or different in kind from that sought in the pleading of the opposing party d. Counterclaim against state. This rule shall not be construed to enlarge any right to assert a claim against the state. e. Counterclaim maturing or acquired after pleading. A claim which either matured or was acquired by the pleader after serving his pleading may, with the permission of the court, be presented as a counterclaim by supplemental pleading. A counterclaim or cross-claim which is not due may be asserted against a party who is insolvent or the representative of a party who has been subjected to insolvency proceedings. If recovery thereon will be impaired because of such party's insolvency. F. Omitted counterclaim. When a pleader fails to set up a counterclaim through oversight, inadvertence, or excusable neglect, or when justice requires, he may by leave of court set up the counterclaim by amendment. g. Cross-claim against co-party. A pleading may state as a cross-claim any claim by one party against a co-party. h. Joinder of additional parties. Persons other than those made parties to the original action may be made parties to a counterclaim or cross-claim in accordance with the provisions of Rules 14, 19 and 20. I. Separate trials separate judgments. If the court orders separate trials as provided in Rule 42 b. Judgment on a counterclaim or cross-claim may be rendered in accordance with the terms of Rule 54 b. When the court has jurisdiction so to do.
even if the claims of the opposing party have been dismissed or otherwise disposed of. In determining whether or not separate trial of a cross-claim shall be ordered, the court shall consider whether the cross-claim 1. Arises out of the transaction or occurrence or series of transactions or occurrences that is the subject matter either of the original action or of a counterclaim therein. 2. Relates to any property or contract that is the subject matter of the original action. Or 3. Claims that the person against whom it is asserted is liable to the cross-claimant for all or part of plaintiff's claim against him. In addition, the court may consider any other relevant factors. J. Effective statute of limitations and other discharges at law. The statute of limitations, a non-claim statute or other discharge at law shall not bar a claim asserted as a counterclaim to the extent that 1. It diminishes or defeats the opposing party's claim if it arises out of the transaction or occurrence that is the subject matter of the opposing party's claim, or if it could have been asserted as a counterclaim to the opposing party's claim before it, the counterclaim was barred, or 2. It or the opposing party's claim relates to payment of or security for the other k. Counterclaim by and against transferees and successors. A counterclaim may be asserted by or against the transferee or successor of a claim subject to the following provisions. 1. A successor who is a guardian, representative of a decedent's estate, receiver or assignee for the benefit of creditors. Trustee or the like may interpose a claim to which he succeeds against claims or proceedings brought in or outside the court of administration. A claim owing by his predecessor may be interposed against any claim brought by such successor in or outside the court of administration without the necessity of filing such claim or cause of action in the administration proceedings. 2. A transferee or successor of a claim takes it subject to any defense or counterclaim that is the subject matter of the opposing party's claim, or that is available to the obligor at the time of the assignment or before the obligor received notice of the assignment. 3. A surety or party with total or partial recourse upon a claim upon which he is being sued may interpose as a counterclaim a. Uh, any claim of his own. And b. Any claim owned by the person against whom he has recourse who either has notice of the suit, is a party to the suit, is insolvent, has assigned his claim to the surety or party asserting it, or cannot be found. A counterclaim under subdivision b must tend to diminish or defeat the opposing party's claim. Or, it or the opposing claim must relate to payment of or security for the other. Unless the person against whom recourse may be had is a party to the suit or the counterclaim has been assigned to the party asserting it. And if recovery on the counterclaim exceeds the opposing party's claim, any excess recovered shall be held in trust for such person against whom there is a right of recourse. 4. Subsections 1. 2 and 3 above are subject to subdivision l of this rule l counterclaim and crossclaim subject to substantive law principles counterclaim and crossclaims are subject to restrictions imposed by other statutes and principles of substantive common law and equity including rules of commercial law agency estoppel contract and the like in appropriate cases the court may impose terms or conditions upon its judgment or decree and may enter conditional or non-canceling cross-judgments to satisfy such restrictions. This provision is intended to deny or limit counterclaims or cross-claims. 1. Where a creditor will receive an unfair priority because a claim is assigned after insolvency proceedings or assigned before such proceedings if it results in an unlawful preference. 
2. Where an unfair priority will be allowed if a surety interposing a claim owned in his own right against the creditor suing on the principal's obligation when the principal is solvent and the creditor is not. 3. Where a claim by or against a representative, such as a guardian, receiver, representative of a decedent's estate, assignee for the benefit of creditors, trustee or the like in his individual capacity is asserted against a claim owing or owed by the estate he represents. 4. Where a claim by or against a partnership or two, two or more obligors is opposed against or by a claim of an individual to the extent that the individual will be allowed unfairly to profit or if it will adversely affect the rights of creditors or 5. Where a claim is cut off by a holder in due course or a transferee who is protected under principles of commercial law, estoppel, or contract. M. Satisfaction of judgment. Satisfaction of a judgment or credits thereon may be ordered, for sufficient cause, upon notice and motion. Credits include any counterclaim which tends to diminish or defeat the judgment or any counterclaim where it or the opposing claim relates to payment of or security for the other. Rule 14. Third Party Practice a. When defendant may bring in third party. A defending party, as a third party plaintiff, may cause a summons and complaint to be served upon a person not a party to the action who is or may be liable to him for all or part of the plaintiff's claim against him. The third-party plaintiff must file the third-party complaint with his original answer or by leave of court thereafter with good cause shown. The person served with the summons and the third-party complaint, herein after called the third-party defendant, as provided in Rules 12 and the 13th of May make 1. His defenses, cross-claims and counterclaims to the third-party plaintiff's claims. 2. His defenses, counterclaims and cross-claims against any other defendants or third-party defendants. 3. Any defenses or claims which the third-party plaintiff has to the plaintiff's claim which are available to the third-party defendant against the plaintiff. And 4. Any defenses or claims which the third-party defendant has as against the plaintiff. The plaintiff may assert any claim against the third-party defendant who thereupon may assert his defenses, counterclaims and cross-claims, as provided in Rules 12 and 13. A third-party defendant may proceed under this rule against any person not a party to the action who is or may be liable to him for all or part of the claim made in the action against the third-party defendant b. When plaintiff may bring in third party. When a counterclaim or other claim is asserted against a plaintiff, he may cause a third party to be brought in under circumstances, which, under this rule, would entitle a defendant to do so. c. Severance parties improperly impleted. With his response of pleading or by motion prior thereto, any party may move for severance of a third-party claim or ensuing claim as provided in this rule or for a separate trial thereon. If the third-party defendant is a proper party to the proceedings under any other rule relating to parties, the action shall continue as in other cases where he is made a party. Rule 15. Amended and Supplemental Pleadings. A. Amendments. A party may amend his pleading once as a matter of course at any time before a response of pleading is served or, if the pleading is one to which no response of pleading is permitted, and the action has not been placed upon the trial calendar. He may so amend it at any time within 30, 30 days after it is served. Otherwise a party may amend his pleading only by leave of court or by written consent of the adverse party. And leave shall be given when justice so requires. A party shall plead in response to an amended pleading within the time remaining for response to the original pleading or within 20, 20 days after service of the amended pleading, whichever period may be the longer.
unless the court otherwise orders. b. Amendments to conform to the evidence. When issues not raised by the place eddings are tried by express or implied consent of the parties, they shall be treated in all respects as if they had been raised in the pleadings. Such amendment of the pleadings as may be necessary to cause them to conform to the evidence and to raise these issues may be made upon motion of any party at any time, even after judgment. But failure so to amend does not affect the result of the trial of these issues. If evidence is objected to at the trial on the ground that it is not within the issues made by the pleadings, the court may allow the pleadings to be amended and shall do so freely when the presentation of the merits of the action will be subserved thereby and the objecting party fails to satisfy the court that the admission of such evidence would prejudice him in maintaining his action or defense upon the merits. The court may grant a continuance to enable the objecting party to meet such evidence. C. Relation back of amendments. Whenever the claim or defense asserted in the amended pleading arose out of the conduct, transaction, or occurrence set forth or attempted to be set forth in the original pleading, the amendment relates back to the date of the original pleading. An amendment changing the party against whom a claim is asserted relates back if the foregoing provision is satisfied and, within 120, 120, days of commencement of the action, the party to be brought in by amendment. 1. Has received such notice of the institution of the action that he will not be prejudiced in maintaining his defense on the merits. And 2. Knew or should have known that but for a mistake concerning the identity of the proper party, the action would have been brought against him. The requirement of subsections 1 and 2 hereof with respect to a governmental organization to be brought into the action as defendant is satisfied. 1 in the case of a state or governmental organization by delivery or mailing of process to the Attorney General or to a governmental executive Rule 4.6 A 3 or 2 in the case of a local governmental organization by delivery or mailing of process to its attorney as provided by statute, to a governmental executive thereof, Rule 4. 6. A. 4. Or to the officer holding the office if suit is against the officer or an office. D. Supplemental pleadings. Upon mition of a party the court may, upon reasonable notice and upon such terms as are just, Permit him to serve a supplemental pleading setting forth transactions or occurrences or events which have happened since the date of the pleading sought to be supplemented. Permission may be granted even though the original pleading is defective in its statement of the claim for relief or defense. If the court deems it advisable that the adverse party plead to the supplemental pleading, it shall so order, specifying the time t here for. Rule 16. Pre-trial procedure, formulating issues. A. When required purpose. In any action except criminal cases, the court may on its discretion and shall upon the motion of any party, direct the attorneys for the parties to appear before it for a conference to consider. 1. The simplification of the issues. 2. The necessity or desirability of amendments to the pleadings. 3. The possibility of obtaining admissions of fact and of documents which will avoid unnecessary proof. 4. A limitation of the number of expert witnesses. 5. An exchange of names of witnesses to be called during the trial and the general nature of their expected testimony. 6. The desirability of using one or more types of alternative dispute resolution under the rules therefore. 7. The desirability of setting deadlines for dispositive motions in light of the date set for trial. And 8. Such other matters as may aid in the disposition of the action. b. When called notice participants.
unless otherwise ordered by the court the pre-trial conference shall not be called until after reasonable opportunity for the completion of discovery. 1. Notice. The clerks shall give at least 30, 30 days notice of the pre-trial conference unless otherwise directed by the court. 2. Participants. At least one, one attorney planning to take part in the trial shall appear for each of the parties and participate in the pre-trial conference. C. Conference of Attorneys. Unless otherwise order ed by the court, at least 10, 10 days prior to the pre-trial conference, attorneys for each of the parties shall meet and confer for the following purposes. 1. Exhibits. Each attorney shall mark for identification and provide opposing counsel an opportunity to inspect and copy all exhibits which he expects to introduce at the trial. Numbers or marks placed on such exhibits shall be prefixed with the symbol P slash T, denoting its pre-trial designation. When the exhibit is introduced at the trial of the case, the P slash T designation will be stricken and the exhibits must also indicate the party identifying same. Exhibits of the character which prohibit or make impracticable their production at conference shall be identified and notice given of their intended use. Necessary arrangements must be made to offer opposing counsel an opportunity to examine such exhibits. 2. Exhibit Stipulations Written stipulations shall be prepared with reference to all exhibits exchanged or identified. The stipulations shall contain all agreements of the parties with reference to the exchanged and identified exhibits, and shall include, but not be limited to, the agreement of the parties with reference to the authenticity of the exhibits, their admissibility and evidence, their use and opening statements and the provisions made for the inspection of identified exhibits. The original of the exhibit stipulations shall be presented to the court at the pre-trial conference. 3. Fact Stipulation The attorneys shall stipulate in writing with reference to all facts and issues not in genuine dispute. The original of the stipulations shall be presented to the court at the time of the pre-trial conference. 4. Exchanged list of witnesses. Attorneys for each of the parties shall furnish opposing counsel with the written list of the names and addresses of all witnesses then known. The original of each witness list shall be presented to the court at the time of the pre-trial conference. 5. Discuss rules on access to court records issues that may arise during the proceedings. 6. Discuss settlement. The possibility of compromise settlement shall be fully discussed and explored. D. Preparation for conference of attorneys and pre-trial. Each attorney shall completely familiarize himself with all aspects of the case in advance of the conference of attorneys and be prepared to enter into stipulations with reference to as many facts and issues and exhibits as possible. E. Duty to arrange conference. It shall be the duty of counsel for both plaintiff and defendant to arrange for the conference of attorneys at least 10, 10 days in advance of the pre-trial conference. F. Refusal to stipulate. If, following the conference of attorneys, either party determines that there are other facts or exhibits that should be stipulated and which opposing counsel refuses to stipulate upon. He shall compile a list of such facts or exhibits and furnish same to opposing counsel at least two, two days in advance of the pre-trial conference. The original of the list shall be presented to the court at the time of the pre-trial conference. G. Witnesses or exhibits discovered subsequent to conference of attorneys and before a pre-trial conference. If. After the conference of the attorneys and before the pre-trial conference, counsel discovers additional exhibits or names of additional witnesses. The same information required to be disclosed at the conference of the attorneys shall be immediately furnished opposing counsel.
the original of any such disclosures shall be presented to the court at the time of the pre-trial conference. H. More than one pre-trial conference. If necessary or advisable, the court may adjourn the pre-trial conference from time to time or may order an additional pre-trial conference. I. Witnesses or exhibits discovered subsequent to pre-trial conference. If, following the pre-trial conference or during trial, counsel discovers additional exhibits or the names of additional witnesses, the same. Opposing counsel. The original of any such disclosure shall immediately be filed with the court and shall indicate the date it was furnished opposing counsel. J. Pre-trial order. The court shall make an order which recites the action taken at the conference, the amendments allowed to the pleading, and the agreements made by the parties as to any of the matters considered which limit the issues for trial to those not disposed of by admissions or agreement of counsel, and such order when entered shall control the subsequent course of action unless modified thereafter to prevent manifest injustice. The court in its discretion may establish by rule a pre-trial calendar on which actions may be placed for consideration as above provided, and may either confine the calendar to jury actions or non-jury actions or extend it to all actions. K. Sanctions. Failure to appear. If without just excuse or because of failure to give reasonable attention to the matter, no appearance is made on behalf of a party at a pre-trial conference, or if an attorney is grossly unprepared to participate in the conference, the court may order either one or both of the following. 1. The payment by the delinquent attorney or party of the reasonable expenses, including attorney's fees, to the aggrieved party or 2. Take such other action as may be appropriate. Rule 17. Parties Plaintiff and Defendant Capacity Aerial Party in Interest Every action shall be prosecuted in the name of the real party in interest. 1. An Executor, Administrator, Guardian, Bailey, Trustee of an Express Trust a party with whom or in whose name a contract has been made for the benefit of another, or a party authorized by statute may sue in his own name without joining with him the party for whose benefit the action is brought, but stating his relationship and the capacity in which he sues. 2. When a statute provides for an action by this state on the relation of another, the action may be brought in the name of the person for whose use or benefit the statute was intended. No action shall be dismissed on the ground that it is not prosecuted in the name of the real party in interest until a reasonable time after objection has been allowed for the real party in interest to ratify the action, or to be joined or substituted in the action. Such ratification, joinder, or substitution shall have the same effect as if the action had been commenced initially in the name of the real party in interest. b. Capacity to sue or be sued. The capacity of a party to sue or be sued as hall be determined by the law of the state, including its conflicts rules, except that a partnership or unincorporated association may sue or be sued in its common name c. Infants or incompetent persons unborn, unknown, and unlocated persons. An infant or incompetent person may sue or be sued in any action. 1. In his own name. 2. In his own name by guardian ad litem or a next friend. 3. In the name of his representative, if the representative is a court-appointed general guardian, committee, conservator, guardian of the estate or other like fiduciary. The court, upon its own motion or upon the motion of any party, must notify and allow the representative named in subsection 3 of this subdivision, if he is known, to represent an infant or incompetent person, and be joined as an additional party in his representative capacity. If an infant or incompetent person is not represented, or is not adequately represented, 
the court shall appoint a guardian ad litem for him. The court may, in its discretion, appoint a guardian ad litem or an attorney for persons who were institutionalized, who are not yet born or in being, who are unknown, who are known but cannot be located, or who are in such position that they cannot procure reasonable representation. The court shall make such other orders as it deems proper for the protection of such parties or persons. Persons with claims against the estate of the ward or against the guardian of his estate as such may proceed under this rule or provisions applicable to GU audienship proceedings. It shall not be necessary that the person for whom guardianship is sought shall be represented by a guardian ad litem in such proceedings. Nothing herein shall affect the right of a guardian to sue or be sued in his personal capacity. The court, in its discretion, may honor the infant's or incompetent's choice of next friend or guardian ad litem, but the court may deny approval or remove a person who is not qualified. A next friend or guardian under subsection C of this rule may be required by the court to furnish bond or additional bond and shall be subject to the rules applicable to guardians of the estate with respect to duties, terms of the bond required, accounting, compensation and termination. D. Sex, marital and parental status. For the purposes of suing or being sued there shall be no distinction between men and women or between men and women because of marital or parental status, provided, however, that this subdivision D shall not apply to actions in tort. E. Partnerships and unincorporated associations. A partnership or an unincorporated association may sue or be sued in its common name. A judgment by or against the partnership or unincorporated association shall bind the organization as if it were an entity. A money judgment against the partnership or unincorporated association shall not bind an individual partner or member unless he is named as a party or is bound as a member of the class in an appropriate action. Rules 23 and 23.2 F. Unknown Persons when the name or existence of a person is unknown, he may be named as an unknown party, and when his true name is discovered his name may be inserted by amendment at any time. Rule 17.1. Parties, state as party attorney general. If in any action or proceeding involving real property, instituted in any court of this state, it appears from the allegations of any pleading filed therein that the state of Indiana has or claims to have a lien upon or an interest in such real estate, the state may be made a party defendant to the action, and shall be bound by any judgment or decree rendered thereon. Service of summons shall be made upon the Attorney General as provided in Rule 4.8. It shall be the duty of the Attorney General in person or by deputy to appear and defend such proceedings or suit, on behalf of the state of Indiana. The Attorney General may, in his discretion, designate the prosecuting attorney of the circuit in which such action is pending as his deputy for the purpose of defending such proceedings or suit on behalf of the state of Indiana. After the prosecuting attorney enters his appearance as such deputy, Pleadings under Rule 5 shall be served upon him for and on behalf of the Attorney General. The State may appeal from such judgment or decree, in like manner and under the same terms and conditions as other parties in like cases. This rule is meant, without limitation, to apply to actions to foreclose a mortgage or other lien on real estate, to subject any real estate to sale or to partition or quiet title to real estate. Further, in any case in which the Attorney General represents the state of Indiana, the judge presiding in the case where such cause is pending, shall promptly notify the Attorney General by United States mail, addressed to his office in Indianapolis, Indiana, of any ruling made in such cause or of the fixing of a date for the trial thereof. Rule 18. Joinder of Claims and Remedies. 
A joinder of claims. A party asserting a claim for relief as an original claim, counterclaim, cross claim, or third party claim, may join, either as independent or as alternate claims, as many claims, whether legal, equitable, or statutory as he has against an opposing party. B. Joinder of remedies fraudulent conveyances. Whenever a claim is one year to four cognizable only after another claim has been prosecuted to a conclusion, the two, two claims may be joined in a single action. But the court shall grant relief in that action only in accordance with the relative substantive rights of the parties. In particular, a plaintiff may state a claim for money and a claim to have set aside a conveyance fraudulent as to him without first having obtained a judgment establishing the claim for money. Rule 19. Joinder of person needed for just adjudication. A person's to be joined if feasible. A person who is subject to service of process shall be joined as a party in the action if 1. In his absence complete relief cannot be accorded among those already parties. Or 2. He claims an interest relating to the subject of the action and he is so situated that the disposition of the action in his absence may a. Uh, as a practical matter impair or impede his ability to protect that interest, or b. Leave any of the persons already parties subject to a substantial risk of incurring double, multiple, or otherwise inconsistent obligations by reason of his claimed interest. If he has not been so joined, the court shall order that he be made a party. If he should join as a plaintiff but refuses to do so, he may be made a defendant. b. Determination by court were never joined or not feasible. Notwithstanding subdivision a of this rule when a person described in subsection 1 or 2 thereof is not made a party. The court may treat the absent party as not indispensable and allow the action to proceed without him. Or the court may treat such absent party as indispensable and dismiss the action if he is not subject to process. In determining whether or not a party is indispensable the court at its discretion and inequity and good conscience shall consider the following factors. 1. The extent to which a judgment rendered in the person's absence might be prejudicial to him or those already parties. 2. The extent to which, by protective provisions in the judgment, by the shaping of relief, or other measures, the prejudice can be lessened or avoided. 3. Whether a judgment rendered in the person's absence will be adequate. 4. Whether the plaintiff will have an adequate remedy if the action is dismissed for non-joinder. c. Pleading non-joinder. Non-joinder under this rule may be raised by motion as provided in Rule 12 b. 7. d. Exception of class actions. This rule is subject to the provisions of Rule 23. e. Parties not indispensable joinder of obligers a seniors, and subrages and subragers. 1. Joint obligers. Joinder of all the parties to a joint and several obligation and to a joint obligation, including a partnership obligation, shall not be required. And joint or separate action may be brought against one or more of such obligers who shall be as subject to permissive joinder as provided in Rule 20. A judgment against fewer than all does not merge or bar the claim against those not made parties for that reason. 2. A senior of claim. Joinder of the a senior or transfer of a claim or chosen action shall not be required in a suit by the assignee who establishes his title by appropriate pleading and proof. But such a senior or transferer shall be subject to permissive joinder as provided in Rule 20. 3. Subrogation. A. Uh, a subrogor may enforce the claim to the extent of his interest or in full without joining the subrogy. B. 
the Subraji may enforce the claim to the extent that he establishes his title or interest by appropriate pleading and proof without joining the Subrogar. C. In such cases the Subrogar or Subraji shall be subject to permissive joinder as provided in Rule 20. Any recovery by the Subrogar to the extent that such recovery is owned by a Subraji shall be made as representative and trustee for the Subraji. F. Governmental organizations and representatives thereof as parties. Suits by or against a governmental organization or governmental representative relating to the acts, power or authority of such organization or representative, including acts under purported power or authority or color thereof by such organization or representative, shall be governed by this provision. 1. Suits by or against a governmental organization or against a representative in his official capacity shall be brought in the name of the governmental organization. Suits naming a governmental representative by his official title or by his name along with his official title shall be deemed to name and include the governmental organization which he represents, and suits naming an unofficial branch. Office or unit of a governmental organization shall be deemed to name and include the governmental organization of which it is a part. But the court upon its own motion or the motion of any party may require the omitted and proper governmental organization to be included at any time. 2. Other government organizations and governmental representatives of the same or other governmental organizations may be joined or made parties to suits in which a governmental organization is named as a party in accordance with the provisions of these rules relating to parties. Failure to name or improper naming of a governmental organization or governmental representative shall be subject to the provisions of these rules relating to parties. 3. A judgment for or against a governmental organization shall also bind affected or successive representatives of such organization. When a governmental representative is named as a party in his individual name or in his individual name along with his official title, the judgment, in an appropriate case, may bind him in his individual capacity. But no judgment against him in his individual capacity shall be rendered against him unless he is so named. No action against a governmental organization or against a governmental representative in his official capacity shall be abated, affected or delayed because of the death, incapacity or replacement of a named or unnamed governmental representative, or because of the fact that the name functions or existence of the governmental organization have been altered or terminated. In either case the action shall proceed without substitution of successors who shall be bound by the judgment in their official capacity. Rule 20. Permissive Joinder of Parties A Permissive Joinder 1. All persons may join in 1. 1. Action as plaintiffs if they assert any right to relief jointly, severally, or in the alternative in respect of or arising out of the same transaction, occurrence, or series of transactions or occurrences. And if any question of law or fact common to all these persons will arise in the action. 2. All persons may be joined in 1. 1. Action as defendants if there is asserted against them jointly, severally, or in the alternative, any right to relief in respect of, or arising out of, the same transaction, occurrence, or series of transactions or occurrences. And if any question of law or fact common to all defendants will arise in the action. A plaintiff or defendant need not be interested in obtaining or defending against all the relief demanded. Judgment may be given for one or more of the plaintiffs according to their respective rights to relief, and against one or more defendants according to their respective liabilities. Unwilling plaintiffs who could join under this rule may be joined by a plaintiff as defendants and the defendant may make any persons who could be joined under this rule parties by alleging their interest therein with a prayer that their rights in the controversy be determined, 
along with any counterclaim or cross-claim against them, if any, as if they had been originally joined as parties. b. Separate trials. The court may make such orders as will prevent a party from being embarrassed, delayed, or put to expense by the inclusion of a party against whom he asserts no claim and who asserts no claim against him and may order separate trials of the entire case or separate issues therein, or make other orders to prevent delay or prejudice. Rule 21. Miss Jointer and Non-Jointer of Parties. Venue and Jurisdiction over the Subject Matter. A Effect of Miss Jointer and Non-Jointer. Miss Jointer of Parties is not ground for dismissal of an action except as otherwise provided in these rules, failure to name another person as a party or include him in the action is not ground for dismissal. But such omission is subject to the right of such person to intervene or of an opposing party to name or include him in the action as permitted by these rules. Subject to its sound discretion and on motion of any party or of its own initiative, the court may order parties dropped or added at any stage of the action and on such terms as are just and will avoid delay. Any claim against a party may be severed and proceeded with separately. Incorrect names and misnomers may be corrected by amendment under Rule 15 at any time. b. Effect of venue or jurisdiction over part of case. The court shall have venue and authority over all persons or claims required to be joined or permissively joined, impleted or included by intervention, interpleader, counterclaim or cross-claim if it has venue or is authorized to determine any claim asserted between any of the parties thereto, notwithstanding any requirement of venue or of jurisdiction over the subject matter applicable to other claims or other parties. The court may transfer the proceedings to the proper court if it determines that venue or authority of the court is dependent upon a claim, or a claim by or against a particular party which appears from the pleadings, or proves to be a sham or made in bad faith, and if another action is pending in this state by or against a person upon the same claim at the time he becomes a party, the court may dismiss the action as to him, or in its sound discretion. It may order all or part of the proceedings to be consolidated with the first pending action. Rule 22. Interpleader. A plaintiff or defendant. Persons having claims against the plaintiff may be joined as defendants and required to interplead when their claims are such that the plaintiff is or may be exposed to double or multiple liability. It is not ground for objection to the joinder that the claims of the several claimants or the titles on which their claims depend do not have a common origin or are not identical but are adverse to and independent of one another, or that the plaintiff avers that he is not liable in whole or part to any or all of the claimants. A defendant exposed to similar liability may obtain such interpleader by way of cross-claim or counterclaim. The provisions of this rule supplement and do not in any way limit the joinder of parties permitted in Rule 20. b. Extension of statutory interpleader. This rule shall extend, but not diminish or reduce the right to interpleader provided by statute. c. Sufficiency of complaint or answer seeking interpleader. A complaint or answer seeking interpleader under Rule 22a is sufficient if 1. It admits that liability is owing or it states that a totally or partially unfounded liability is asserted to be owing to either one or more of the parties interpleaded. 2. It declares that because of such claims the person seeking interpleader is or may be exposed to double or multiple liability. And 3. It prays that the parties interpleaded assert their claims against the party seeking interpleader and against each other. The complaint may also show, if such is the fact, that the person seeking interpleader has deposited with the court money, or property, or a bond securing performance.
It also may include appropriate prayers for equitable relief, including injunction against other non-pending suits by the parties interpleaded, against the person seeking interpleader or among themselves. Except to the extent that the issues are raised by the pleadings of the person seeking interpleader, the claims of those interpleaded, whether dependent or independent, may be pleaded in the same manner as if the claims were counterclaims or cross-claims under Rule 13 and within the time as prescribed by Rule 6. Incorrectness of the interpleader under Rule 22a is grounds for dismissal as provided in Rule 12b-6. New service against defaulting parties required by Rule 5a shall not apply to the response of pleadings filed by parties named to interpleader proceedings under Rule 22a unless ordered by the court. Trial of the issues may be held at one, one hearing or in successive stages at the sound discretion of the court and subject to Rule 42. d. Release from liability deposit or delivery. Any party seeking interpleader, as provided in subdivision a of this rule, may deposit with the court the amount claimed, or deliver to the court or as otherwise directed by the court the property claimed, and the court may thereupon order such party discharged from liability as to such claims, and the action continued as between the claimants of such money or property. Rule 23 Class Actions A Prerequisites to a Class Action One or more members of a class may sue or be sued as representative parties on behalf of all only if 1. The class is so numerous that joinder of all members is impracticable 2. There are questions of law or fact common to the class 3. The claims or defenses of the representative parties are typical of the claims or defenses of the class. And 4. The representative parties will fairly and adequately protect the interests of the class. b. Class actions maintainable. An action may be maintained as a class action if the prerequisites of subdivision a are satisfied, and in addition, 1. The prosecution of separate actions by or against individual members of the class would create a risk of a uh, inconsistent or varying adjudications with respect to individual members of the class which would establish incompatible standards of conduct for the party opposing the class, or b. Adjudications with respect to individual members of the class which would as a practical matter be dispositive of the interests of the other members not parties to the adjudications or substantially impair or impede their ability to protect their interests or 2. The party opposing the class has acted or refused to act on grounds generally applicable to the class thereby making appropriate final injunctive relief or corresponding declaratory relief with respect to the class as a whole. Or 3. The court finds that the questions of law or fact common to the members of the class predominate over any questions affecting only individual members, and that a class action is superior to other available methods for the fair and efficient adjudication of the controversy. The matters pertinent to the findings include a. Uh, the interests of members of the class in individually controlling the prosecution or defense of separate actions. b. The extent and nature of any litigation concerning the controversy already commenced by or against members of the class. c. The desirability or undesirability of concentrating the litigation of the claims in a particular forum d. The difficulties likely to be encountered in the management of a class action. c. Determination by order whether class action to be maintained notice judgment actions conducted partially as class actions. 1. As soon as practicable after the commencement of an action brought as a class action, the court, upon hearing or waiver of hearing, shall determine by order whether it is to be so maintained. An order under this subdivision may be conditional, and may be altered or amended before the decision on the merits. 
2. In any class action maintained under subdivision B. 3. The court shall direct to the members of the class the best notice practicable under the circumstances, including individual notice to all members who can be identified through reasonable effort. The notice shall advise each member that a. Uh, the court will exclude him from the class if he so requests by a specified date. b. The judgment, whether favorable or not, will include all members who do not request exclusion. And c. Any member who does not request exclusion may, if he desires, enter an appearance through his counsel. 3. The judgment in an action maintained as a class action under subdivision B. 1 or B. 2, whether or not favorable to the class, shall include and describe those whom the court finds to be members of the class. The judgment in an action maintained as a class action under subdivision B. 3, whether or not favorable to the class, shall include and specify or describe those to whom the notice provided in subdivision C. 2 was directed, and who have not requested exclusion, and whom the court finds to be members of the class. 4. When appropriate, a. An action may be brought or maintained as a class action with respect to particular issues, or b. A class may be divided into subclasses and each subclass treated as a class, and the provisions of this rule shall then be construed and applied accordingly. d. Orders and conduct of actions. In the conduct of actions to which this rule applies, the court may make appropriate orders. 1. Determining the course of proceedings or prescribing measures to prevent undue repetition or complication in the presentation of evidence or argument. 2. Requiring, for the protection of the members of the class or otherwise for the fair conduct of the action, that notice be given in such manner as the court may direct to some or all of the members of any step in the action, or of the proposed extent of the judgment or of the opportunity of members to signify whether they consider the representation fair and adequate, to intervene and in present claims or defenses, or otherwise to come into the action. 3. Imposing conditions on the representative parties or on interveners. 4. Requiring that the pleadings be amended to eliminate therefrom allegations as to representation of absent persons, and that the action proceed accordingly. 5. Dealing with similar procedural matters. The orders may be combined with an order under Rule 16, and may be altered or amended as may be desirable from time to time. The court shall allow reasonable attorney's fees and reasonable expenses incurred from a fund recovered for the benefit of a CLAS under this section and the court may apportion such recovery among different attorneys. e. Dismissal or compromise. A class action shall not be dismissed or compromised without the approval of the court, and notice of the proposed dismissal or compromise shall be given to all members of the class in such manner as the court directs. F. Disposition of residual funds. 1. Residual funds are funds that remain after the payment of all approved class member claims, expenses, litigation costs, attorney's fees and other court-approved disbursements to implement the relief granted. Nothing in this rule is intended to limit the trial court from approving a settlement that does not create residual funds. 2. Any order entering a judgment or approving a proposed compromise of a class action certified under this rule that establishes a process for identifying and compensating members of the class shall provide for the disbursement of residual funds, unless otherwise agreed. In matters where the claims process has been exhausted and residual funds remain not less than 25%, 25% of the residual funds shall be dispersed to the Indiana Bar Foundation to support the activities and programs of the Coalition for Court Access and its pro bono districts.
the court may disperse the balance of any residual funds beyond the minimum percentage to the Indiana Bar Foundation or to any other entity for purposes that have a direct or indirect relationship to the objectives of the underlying litigation or otherwise promote the substantive or procedural interests of members of the certified class. Rule 23.1 Derivative Actions by Shareholders in a derivative action brought by one or more shareholders or members or holders of an interest in such shares or membership, legal or equitable, to enforce a right of a corporation or of an unincorporated association, the corporation or association having failed to enforce a right which may properly be asserted by it, the complaint shall be verified and shall allege that the plaintiff was a shareholder or member or holder of an interest legal or equitable in such shares or membership at the time of the transaction or any part thereof of which he complains or that his share or membership made by the plaintiff to obtain the action he desires from the directors or comparable authority and the reasons for his failure to obtain the action or for not making the effort the derivative action may not be maintained if it appears that the plaintiff does not fairly and adequately represent the interests of the shareholders or members similarly situated in enforcing the right of the corporation or association. The action shall not be dismissed or compromised without the approval of the court, and notice of the proposed dismissal or compromise shall be given to shareholders or members in such manner as the court directs. Rule 23.2. Actions Relating to Unincorporated Associations In addition to an action brought by or against an unincorporated association under Rule 17 e, an action may be brought against the members of an unincorporated association as a class by naming certain members as representative parties if it appears that the members bringing suit or served with process or the representative parties will fairly and adequately protect the interests of the association and its members. In the conduct of the action the court may make appropriate orders corresponding with those described in Rule 23d, and the procedure for dismissal or compromise of the action shall correspond with that provided in Rule 23e. Rule 24. Intervention. A. Intervention of Right. Upon Tim Ely motion anyone shall be permitted to intervene in an action. 1. When a statute confers an unconditional right to intervene. Or 2. When the applicant claims an interest relating to a property, fund or transaction which is the subject of the action and he is so situated that the disposition of the action may as a practical matter impair or impede his ability to protect his interest in the property, fund or transaction. Unless the applicant's interest is adequately represented by existing parties. b. Permissive intervention. Upon timely filly and g of his motion anyone may be permitted to intervene in an action. 1. When a statute confers a conditional right to intervene. Or 2. When an applicant's claim or defense and the main action of a question of law or fact in common. When a party to an action relies for ground of claim or defense upon any statute or executive order administered by a federal or state governmental officer or agency or upon any regulation, order, requirement, or agreement issued or made pursuant to the statute or executive administrative order, the governmental unit upon timely application may be permitted to intervene in the action. In exercising its discretion the court shall consider whether the intervention will unduly delay or prejudice the adjudication of the rights of the original parties. C. Procedure. A person desiring to intervene shall serve a motion to intervene upon the parties as provided in Rule 5. The motion shall state the grounds therefore and set forth or include by reference the claim defense or matter for which intervention is sought. Intervention after trial or after judgment for purposes of a motion under Rules 50, 
59, or 60, or an appeal may be allowed upon motion. The court's determination upon a motion to intervene shall be interlocutory for all purposes unless made final under trial rule 54 b. Rule 25. Substitution of parties. A. Death. 1. If a party dies and the claim is not thereby extinguished, the court may order substitution of the proper parties. The motion for substitution may be made by the court, any party or by the successors or representatives of the deceased party and, together with the notice of hearing, shall be served on the parties as provided in Rule 5 and upon persons not parties in the manner provided in Rule 4 for the service of summons. Motion for substitution may be made before or after judgment, and if substitution is not reflected in the papers upon which the appeal is based, any party shall, by notice filed with the clerk of the court on appeal, advise the court on appeal of the substitution of any party. However, if the case is returned to the lower court after the judgment or order upon appeal becomes final, the motion may then be made in such lower court. 2. In the event of the death of one or more of the plaintiffs or of one or more of the defendants in an action in which the right sought to be enforced survives only to the surviving plaintiffs or only against the surviving defendants, the action does not abate. The death may be suggested upon the record and the action shall proceed I in favor of or against the surviving parties. b. Incompetency. If a party becomes incompetent, the court upon motion served as provided in subdivision a of this rule may allow the action to be continued by or against his representative in the same manner as against a decedent party. c. Transfer of interest. In case of any transfer of interest, the action may be continued by or against the original party, unless the court upon motion directs the person to whom the interest is transferred to be substituted in the action or joined with the original party. Service of the motion shall be made as provided in subdivision A of this rule. D. Persons substituted on death personal representative or successors in interest. The proper party or parties to be substituted for the party who dies under subsection 1 of subdivision A of this rule includes 1. A successor in interest whose rights or obligations do not pass to the representative of the deceased party's estate or 2. If the interest passes to or binds the representative of the deceased party's estate, either such representative or if it is established that the estate of the deceased party is closed or that opening of such estate is unnecessary. The successor of such estate. e. Necessity of filing claims against the state when representative substituted proceedings to enforce judgment, execution and judgment liens. A claim based upon a judgment against a party who dies before or after judgment is entered shall be allowed by the court administering his estate even though the claim is not filed with such court if the representative of such estate is substituted as a party within the time when such claim or judgment could have been filed as a claim against the estate under the probate code. Judgments upon an action against a party who dies whether entered before or after his death shall be satisfied from the assets of his estate by the decedent's representative, and no execution. Proceedings supplemental or enforcement orders shall issue on the judgment after the party has died as against his property. But this provision shall not prevent enforcement of execution liens, judgment liens, liens acquired by judicial proceedings, security interests, mortgages, liens or interests in property acquired before his death and being enforced by or under the judgment, subject to any rights of the representative to redeem or stay enforcement as now provided by law. f. Public officers, death or separation from office. 
1. When a public officer is a party to an action or other proceeding in an official capacity and during its pendency dies, resigns, or otherwise ceases to hold office. The action does not abate and the officer's successor is automatically substituted as a party. Proceedings following substitution shall be I in the name of the substituted party, but any misnomer not affecting the substantial rights of the parties shall be disregarded. An order of substitution may be entered at any time, but the omission to enter such an order shall not affect the substitution. 2. A public officer who sues or is sued in an official capacity may be described as a party by the officer's official title rather than by name, but the court may require the officer's name to be added. Rule 26. General Provisions Governing Discovery A. Discovery Methods. Parties may obtain discovery by one or more of the following methods. 1. Depositions upon oral examination or written questions. 2. Written interrogatories. 3. Production of documents, electronically stored information, or things or permission to enter upon land or other property, for inspection and other purposes. 4. Physical and mental examination. 5. Requests for admission unless the court orders otherwise under subdivision C of this rule, the frequency of use of these methods is not limited. A.1 Electronic Format In addition to service under Rule 5 B or A PDF format electronic copy, a party propounding or responding to interrogatories, requests for production or requests for admission shall comply with A or B of T his subsection. A. Uh, the party shall serve the discovery request or response in an electronic format either on a disk or as an electronic document attachment in any commercially available word processing software system. If transmitted on disk, each disk as hall be labeled, identifying the caption of the case the document, and the word processing version in which it is being submitted. If more than one disk is used for the same document, each disk shall be labeled and also shall be sequentially numbered. If transmitted by electronic mail, the document must be accompanied by electronic memorandum providing the foregoing identifying information. Or b. The party shall serve the opposing party with a verified statement that the attorney or party appearing pro se lacks the equipment and is unable to transmit the discovery as required by this rule. b. Scope of discovery. Unless otherwise limited by order of the court in accordance with these rules, the scope of discovery is as follows. 1. In general. Parties may obtain discovery regarding any matter, not privileged, which is relevant to the subject matter involved in the pending action. Whether it relates to the claim or defense of the party seeking discovery or the claim or defense of any other party, including the existence, description, nature, custody, condition and location of any books, documents or other tangible things in the identity and location of persons having knowledge of any discoverable matter. It is not ground for objection that the information sought will be inadmissible at the trial if the information sought appears reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. The frequency or extent of use of the discovery methods otherwise permitted under these rules and by any local rule shall be limited by the court if it determines that i. the discovery sought is unreasonably cumulative or duplicative or is obtainable from some other source that is more convenient, less burdensome, or less expensive. 2. The party seeking discovery has had ample opportunity by discovery in the action to obtain the information sought or 3. The burden or expense of the proposed discovery outweighs its likely benefit, taking into account the needs of the case, the amount in controversy, the party's resources, the importance of the issues at stake in the litigation, 
and the importance of the proposed discovery in resolving the issues. The court may act upon its own initiative after reasonable notice or pursuant to a motion under Rule 26 c. 2. Insurance Agreements a party may obtain discovery of the existence and contents of any insurance agreement under which any person carrying on an insurance business may be liable to satisfy part or all of a judgment which may be entered in the action no or to indemnify or reimburse for payments made to satisfy the judgment. Information concerning the insurance agreement is not by reason of disclosure admissible in evidence at trial. For purposes of this paragraph, an application for insurance shall not be treated as part of an insurance agreement. 3. Trial Preparation Materials Subject to the provisions of Subdivision B. 4 of this rule, a party may obtain discovery of documents and tangible things otherwise discoverable under subdivision B. 1 of this rule and prepared in anticipation of litigation or for trial by or for another party or by or for that other party's representative, including his attorney, consultant, surety, indemnitor, insurer or agent only upon a showing that the party seeking discovery has substantial need of the materials in the preparation of his case and that he is unable without undue hardship to obtain the substantial equivalent of the materials by other means. In ordering discovery of such materials when the required showing has been made, the court shall protect against disclosure of the mental impressions, conclusions, opinions, or legal theories of an attorney or other representative of a party concerning the litigation. A party may obtain without the required showing a statement concerning the action or its subject matter previously made by that party. Upon request, a person not a party may obtain without the required showing a statement concerning the action or its subject matter previously made by that person. If the request is refused, the person may move for a court order. The provisions of Rule 37A.4 apply to the award of expenses incurred in relation to the motion. For purposes of this paragraph, a statement previously made is a, a written statement signed or otherwise adopted approved by the person making it, or b. A stenographic, mechanical, electrical, or other recording, or a transcription thereof, which is a substantially verbatim recital of an oral statement by the person making it and contemporaneously recorded. 4. Trial Preparation Experts Discovery of facts known and opinions held by experts, otherwise discoverable under the provisions of Subdivision B. 1 of this rule and acquired or developed in anticipation of litigation or for trial may be obtained as follows. A. I. A party may through interrogatories require any other party to identify each person whom the other party expects to cause an expert witness at trial, to state the subject matter on which the expert is expected to testify, and T. O. State the substance of the facts and opinions to which the expert is expected to testify and a summary of the grounds for each opinion. 2. Upon motion, the court may order further discovery by other means, subject to such restrictions as to scope and as such provisions, pursuant to subdivision B. 4. C. of this rule, concerning fees and expenses as the court may deem appropriate. b. A party may discover facts known or opinions held by an expert who has been retained or specially employed by another part y in anticipation of litigation or preparation for trial and who is not expected to be called as a witness at trial only as provided in Rule 35 b. or upon a showing of exceptional circumstances under which it is impracticable for the party seeking discovery to obtain facts or opinions on the same subject by other means c. unless manifest injustice would result.
I, the court shall require that the party seeking discovery pay the expert a reasonable fee for time spent in responding to discovery under subdivision B, 4, A, 2, and B, 4, B, of this rule. And 2. With respect to discovery obtained under subdivision B, 4, A, 2, of this rule the court may require and with respect to discovery obtained under subdivision B, 4, B, of this rule the court shall require the party seeking discovery to pay the other party a fair portion of the fees and expenses reasonably incurred by the latter party in obtaining facts and opinions from the expert. 5. Claims of privilege or protection. A. Uh, information withheld. When a party withholds information otherwise discoverable under these rules by claiming that it is privileged or subject to protection as trial preparation material, the party shall make the claim expressly and shall describe the nature of the documents, communications, or things not produced or disclosed in a manner that, without revealing information itself privileged or protected, will enable other parties to assess the applicability of the privilege or protection. b. Information produced. If information is produced in discovery that is subject to a claim of privilege or protection as trial preparation material, the party making the claim may notify any party that received the information of the claim and the basis for it. After being notified, a party must promptly return sequester, or destroy the specified information and any copies it has and may not use or disclose the information until the claim is resolved. A receiving party may promptly present the information to the court under seal for a determination of the claim. If the receiving party disclose the information before being notified, it must take reasonable steps to retrieve it. The producing party must preserve the information until the claim is resolved. C. Protective orders. Upon motion by any party or by the person from whom discovery is sought, and for good cause shown, the court in which the action is pending or alternatively, on matters relating to a deposition, the court in the county where the deposition is being taken may make any order which justice requires to protect a party or person from annoyance, embarrassment, oppression, or undue burden or expense, including one or more of the following. 1. That the discovery not be had. 2. That the discovery may be had only on specified terms and conditions, including a designation of the time or place. 3. That the discovery may be had only by a method of discovery other than that selected by the party seeking discovery. 4. That certain matters not be inquired into, or that the scope of the discovery be limited to certain matters. 5. That discovery be conducted with no one present except the parties and their attorneys and persons designated by the court. 6. That a deposition after being sealed be opened only by order of the C.R.T. 7. That a trade secret or other confidential research, development, or commercial information not be disclosed or be disclosed only in a designated way. 8. That the parties simultaneously file specified documents or information enclosed in sealed envelopes to be opened as directed by the court. If the motion for a protective order is denied in whole or in part, the court may, on such terms and conditions as are just, order that any party or person provide or permit discovery. The provisions of Trial Rule 37A-4 apply to the award of expenses incurred in relation to the motion. 9. That a party need not provide discovery of electronically stored information from sources that the party identifies as not reasonably accessible because of undue burden or cost. On motion to compel discovery or for a protective order, the party from whom discovery is sought must show that the information is not reasonably accessible because of undue burden or cost. If that showing is made, 
the court may nonetheless order discovery from such sources if the requesting party shows good cause. The court may specify conditions for the discovery. d. Sequence and timing of discovery. Unless the court upon motion, for the convenience of parties and and the fact that a party is conducting discovery, whether by deposition or otherwise, shall not operate to delay any other party's discovery. e. Supplementation of responses. A party who has responded to a request for discovery with a response that was complete when made is under no duty to supplement his response to include information thereafter acquired, except as follows. 1. A party is under a duty seasonably to supplement his response with respect to any question directly addressed to a. Uh, the identity and location of persons having knowledge of discoverable matters, and b. The identity of each person expected to be called as an expert witness at trial, the subject matter on which he is expected to testify, and the substance of his testimony. 2. A party is under a duty seasonably to amend a prior response if he obtains information upon the basis of which a. Uh, he knows that the response was incorrect when made, or b. He knows that the response though correct when made is no longer true and the circumstances are such that a failure to amend the response is in substance a knowing concealment. 3. A duty to supplement responses may be imposed by order of the court, agreement of the parties, or at any time prior to trial through new requests for supplementation of prior responses. f. Informal resolution of discovery disputes. Before any party files any motion or request to compel discovery pursuant to Rule 37 or any motion for protection from discovery pursuant to Rule 26 C, or any other discovery motion which seeks to enforce, modify, or limit discovery. That party shall 1. Make a reasonable effort to reach agreement with the opposing party concerning the matter which is the subject of the motion or request, and 2. Include in the motion or request a statement showing that the attorney making the motion or request has made a reasonable effort to reach agreement with the opposing attorney s. concerning the matter s. set forth in the motion or request. This statement shall recite, in addition, the date, time and place of this effort to reach agreement, whether in person or by phone, and the names of all parties and attorneys participating therein. If an attorney for any party advises the court in writing that an opposing attorney has refused or delayed meeting and discussing the issues covered in this subsection F, the court may take such action as is appropriate. The court may deny a discovery motion filed by a party who has failed to comply with the requirements of this subsection. Rule 27. Depositions before action or pending appeal. A before action. 1. Petition. A person who desires to perpetuate his own testimony or that of another person regarding any matter that may be cognizable in any court in which the action may be commenced, may file a verified petition in any such court of this state. The petition shall be entitled in the name of the petitioner and shall state facts showing uh, that the petitioner expects to be a party to an action cognizable in a court of this or another state. b. The subject matter of the expected action and his interest therein. c. The facts which he desires to establish by the proposed testimony and his reasons for desiring to perpetuate it. d. The names or description of the persons he expects will be adverse parties and their addresses so far as known. and e. The names and addresses of the persons to be examined in the substance of the testimony which he expects to elicit from each. and shall ask for an order authorizing the petitioner to take the depositions of the persons to be examined named in the petition, for the purpose of perpetuating their testimony. 
to notice and service. The petitioner shall thereafter serve a notice upon each person named in the petition as an expected adverse party, together with a copy of the petition, stating that the petitioner will apply to the court at a time and place named therein for the order described in the petition. At least 20, 20 days before the date of hearing the notice shall be served in the manner provided in Rule 4 for service of summons. But if such service cannot with due diligence be made upon any expected adverse party named in the petition, the court may make such order as is just for service by publication or otherwise, and shall appoint for persons not served in the manner provided in Rule 4, an attorney who shall represent them, and, in case they are not otherwise represented, shall cross-examine the deponent. If any expected adverse party is a minor or incompetent the provisions of Rule 17 C apply. 3. Order and Examination if the court is satisfied that the perpetuation of the testimony may prevent a failure or delay of justice, it shall make an order designating or describing the persons whose depositions may be taken and specifying the subject matter of the examination or written interrogatories. The depositions may then be taken in accordance with these rules and the court may make orders of the character provided for by Rules 34 and 35. For the purpose of applying these rules to depositions for perpetuating testimony, each reference therein to the court in which the action is pending shall be deemed to refer to the court in which the petition for such deposition was filed. 4. Use of Deposition if a deposition to perpetuate testimony is taken under these rules or if, although not so taken, it would be admissible in evidence in the court of the state in which it is taken, it may be used in any action involving the same subject matter subsequently brought in a court of this state in accordance with the provision of Rule 32. b. Pending Appeal if an appeal has been taken from a judgment of any court or before the taking of an appeal if the time therefore has not expired, the court in which the judgment was rendered may allow the taking of the depositions of witnesses to perpetuate their testimony for use in the event of further proceedings in such court. In such case the party who desires to perpetuate the testimony may make a motion in the court for leave to take the depositions upon the same notice and service thereof as if the action was pending in the court. The motion shall show 1. The names and addresses of the persons to be examined in the substance of the testimony which he expects to elicit from each. 2. The reasons for perpetuating their testimony. If the court finds that the perpetuation of the testimony is proper to avoid a failure or delay of justice, it may make an order allowing the depositions to be taken and may make orders of the character provided for by Rules 34 and 35. And thereupon the depositions may be taken and used in the same manner and under the same conditions as are prescribed in these rules for depositions taken in actions pending in the court. c. Perpetuation by action. This rule does not limit the power of a court to entertain an action to perpetuate testimony. d. Filing Deposition The filing or custody of any deposition or evidence obtained under this rule shall be in accordance with Trial Rule 5 e. Rule 28 Persons before whom depositions may be taken Discovery across state lines Before administrative agencies and after judgment. A. Within the United States. Within the United States or within a territory or insular possession subject to the dominion of the United States, depositions shall be taken before an officer authorized to administer oaths by the laws of the United States or of the state of Indiana or of the place where the examination is held or before a person appointed by the court in which the action is pending. A person so appointed has power to administer oaths and take testimony. b. In foreign countries. 
In a foreign country, depositions may be e taken. 1. On notice before a person authorized to administer oaths in the place in which the examination is held, either by the law thereof or by the law of the United States. Or 2. Before a person commissioned by the court, and a person so commissioned shall have the power by virtue of his commission to administer any necessary oath and take testimony. Or 3. Pursuant to the letter rogatory. A commission or a letter rogatory shall be issued on application and notice and on terms that are just and appropriate. It is not requisite to the issuance of a seal mission or a letter rogatory that the taking of the deposition in any other manner is impracticable or inconvenient, and both a commission and a letter rogatory may be issued in proper cases. A notice or commission may designate the person before whom t he deposition is to be taken either by name or descriptive title. A letter rogatory may be addressed to the appropriate authority in here name the country. Evidence obtained in response to the letter rogatory need not be excluded merely for the reason that it is not a verbatim transcript or that the testimony was not taken under oath or for any similar departure from the requirements for depositions taken within the United States under these rules. C. Disqualification for interest. Unless otherwise permitted by these rules, no deposition shall be taken before a person who is a relative or employee or attorney or counsel of any of the parties, or is a relative or employee of such attorney or counsel, or is financially interested in the action. D. Scope of discovery outside state protective and enforcement orders. A deposition may be taken outside the state as provided in subdivisions A and B of this rule, and the deponent may be requested to produce documents and things, and may also be requested to allow inspections and copies as provided in Rule 34 to submit to examination under Rule 35. Protective orders may be granted by the court in which the action is pending and by the court where discovery is being made. Enforcement orders may be made by the court where the discovery is sought, and enforcement orders and sanctions may be made by the court where the action is pending as against parties and as against witnesses subject to the jurisdiction of the court. When no action is pending, a court of the state may authorize a deposition to be taken outside the state of any person and upon any matters allowed by Rule 27 e. Assistance to tribunals and litigants outside the state. A court of the state may order a person who is domiciled or is found within t his state to give his testimony or statement or to produce documents or other things. Allow inspections and copies and permit physical and mental examinations for use in a proceeding in a tribunal outside the state. The order may be made upon the application of any interested person or in response to the letter rogatory and may prescribe the practice and procedure, which may be wholly or in part the practice and procedure of the tribunal outside this state. For taking the testimony or statement or producing the documents or other things. To the extent that the order does not prescribe otherwise, the practice and procedure shall be in accordance with that of the court of the state issuing the order. The order may direct that the testimony or statement be given, or document or other thing produced, before a person appointed by the court. The person appointed shall have power to administer any necessary oath. A person within the state may voluntarily give his testimony or statement or produce documents or other things allowing inspections and copies and permit physical and mental examinations for use in a proceeding before a tribunal outside the state. F. Discovery proceedings before administrative agencies. Whenever an adjudicatory hearing, including any hearing in any proceeding subject to judicial review, is held by or before an administrative agency.
Any party to that adjudicatory hearing shall be entitled to use the discovery provisions of Rules 26 through 37 of the Indiana Rules of Trial Procedure. Such discovery may include any relevant matter in the custody and control of the administrative agency. Protective and other orders shall be obtained first from the administrative agency, and if enforcement of such orders or right of discovery is necessary, it may be obtained in a court of general jurisdiction in the county where discovery is being made or sought, or where the hearing is being held. G. Applicability of other laws. This rule does not repeal or modify any other law of this state permitting another procedure for obtaining discovery for use in this state or in a tribunal outside this state, except as expressly provided in these rules. H. Discovery after judgment. Discovery after judgment may be had in proceedings to enforce or to challenge the judgment. Rule 29. Stipulations regarding discovery procedure. Unless the court orders otherwise, the parties may by written stipulation 1. Provide that depositions may be taken before any person, at any time or place, upon any notice, and in any manner and when so taken may be used like other depositions, and 2. Modify the procedures provided by these rules for other methods of discovery. Rule 30. Depositions upon oral examination. a. When depositions may be taken. After commencement of the action, any party may take the testimony of any person, including a party, by deposition upon oral examination. Leave of court, granted with or without notice must be obtained only if the plaintiff seeks to take a deposition prior to the expiration of 20, 20 days after service of summons and complaint upon any defendant except that leave is not required. 1. If a defendant has served a notice of taking deposition or otherwise sought discovery, or 2. If special notice is given as provided in subdivision B. 2. Of this rule. The attendance of witnesses may be compelled by the use of subpoena as provided in Rule 45. The deposition of a person confined in prison may be taken only by leave of court on such terms as the court prescribes. b. Notice of examination, general requirements special notice non-stenographic recording production of documents and things deposition of organization. 1. A party desiring to take the deposition of any person upon oral examination shall give reasonable notice in writing to every other party to the action. The notice shall state the time and place for taking the deposition and the name and address of each person to be examined, if known, and if the name is not known. A general description sufficient to identify him or the particular class or group to which he belongs. If a subpoena induces tecumus to be served on the person to be examined, a designation of the materials to be produced the roinder shall be attached to or included in the notice. 2. Leave of court, when required by subdivision. A of this rule is not required for the taking of a deposition by plaintiff if the notice a. Uh, states that the person to be examined is about to go out of the state or will be unavailable for examination unless his deposition is taken before expiration of the 20, 20 day period. And b. Sets forth facts to support the statement. The plaintiff's attorney shall sign the notice, and his signature constitutes a certification by him that to the best of his knowledge, information, and believe the statement and supporting facts are true. The sanctions provided by Rule 11 are applicable to the certification. If any party shows that when he was served with notice under this subdivision B. 2. He was unable through the exercise of diligence to obtain counsel to represent him at the taking of the deposition, the deposition may not be used against him. 3. The court may for cause shown enlarge or shorten the time for taking the deposition. 
4. If a party taking a deposition wishes to have the testimony recorded other than in a manner provided in Rule 74, the notice shall specify the manner of recording and preserving the deposition. The court may require stenographic taking or make any other order to assure that the recorded testimony will be accurate and trustworthy. 5. The notice to a deponent may be accompanied by a request made in compliance with Rule 34 for the production of documents and tangible things at the taking of the deposition. 6. A party may in his notice name as the deponent and organization, including without limitation a governmental organization, or a partnership and designate with reasonable particularity the matters on which examination is requested. The organization so named shall designate one or more officers, directors, or managing agents, executive officers, or other persons duly authorized and consenting to testify on its behalf. The persons so designated shall testify as to matters known or available to the organization. This subdivision B6 does not preclude taking a deposition by any other procedure authorized in these rules. C. Examination and Cross-Examination Record of Examination Oath Objections Examination and cross-examination of witnesses may proceed as permitted at the trial under the provisions of Rule 43b. T. He officer before whom the deposition is to be taken shall put the witness on oath and shall personally, or by someone acting under his direction and in his presence, record the testimony of the witness. The testimony shall be taken stenographically or recorded by any other means designated in accordance with subdivision B. 4 of this rule. If requested by one of the parties, the testimony shall be transcribed. All objections made at the time of the examination to the qualifications of the officer taking T. He deposition, or to the manner of taking it, or to the evidence presented, or to the conduct of any party and any other objection to the proceedings shall be noted by the officer upon the deposition. When there is an objection to a question, the objection and reason therefore shall be noted, and the question shall be answered unless the attorney instructs the deponent not to answer, or the deponent refuses to answer, in which case either party may have the question certified by the reporter and the question with the objection or two when so certified shall be delivered to the party requesting the certification, who may then proceed under Rule 37a. In lieu of participating in the oral examination, parties may serve written questions on the party taking T. He deposition and require him to transmit them to the officer, who shall propound them to the witness and record the answers verbatim. D. Motion to terminate or limit examination. At any time during the taking of the deposition, on motion of any party or of the deponent and upon a showing that the examination is being conducted in bad faith or in such manner as unreasonably to annoy, embarrass, or oppress the deponent or party, the court in which the action is pending or the court in the county where the deposition is being taken may order the officer conducting the examination to cease forthwith from taking the deposition or may limit the scope and manner of the taking of the deposition as provided in Rule 26 c. If the order made terminates the examination, it shall be resumed thereafter only upon the order of the court in which the action is pending. Upon demand of the objecting party or deponent the taking of the deposition shall be suspended for the time necessary to make a motion for an order. The provisions of Rule 37 a. 4 apply to the award of expenses incurred in relation to the motion. e. Submission to witness changes signing. 1. When the testimony is fully transcribed. The deposition shall be submitted to the witness for reading and signing and he shall be read to or by him, unless such reading and signing have been waived by the witness and by each party.
submitted to the witness as used in this subsection shall mean a mailing of written notification by registered or certified mail to the witness and each attorney attending the deposition that the deposition can be read and examined in the office of the officer before whom the deposition was taken, or b. mailing the original deposition by registered or certified mail to the witness at an address designated by the witness or his attorney, if requested to do so by the witness, his attorney, or the party taking the deposition. 2. If the witness desires to change any answer in the deposition submitted to him, each change, with a statement of the reason therefore, shall be made by the witness on a separate form provided by the officer shall be signed by the witness and affixed to the original deposition by the officer. A copy of such changes shall be furnished by the officer to each party. 3. If the reading and signing have not been waived by the witness and by each party the deposition shall be signed by the witness and returned by him to the officer within 30, 30 days after it is submitted to the witness. If the deposition has been returned to the officer and has not been signed by the witness, the officer shall execute a certificate of that fact, attach it to the original deposition and deliver it to the party taking it. In such event, the deposition may be used by any party with the same force and effect as though it had been signed by the witness. 4. In the event the deposition is not returned to the officer within 30, 30 days after it has been submitted to the witness, the reporter shall execute a certificate of that fact and see as the certificate to be delivered to the party taking it. In such event, any party may use a copy of the deposition with the same force and effect as though the original had been signed by the witness. F. Certification and Filing Exhibits Copies 1. The officer shall certify on the deposition that the witness was duly sworn by him and that the deposition is a true record of the testimony given by the witness. He shall then securely seal the deposition in an envelope endorsed with the title of the action and marked deposition of here insert name of witness and shall promptly deliver it to the party taking the deposition documents and things, unless objection is made to their production for inspection during the examination of the witness, shall be e-marked for identification and annexed to and returned with the deposition, and may be inspected and copied by any party, except that a. Uh, the person producing the materials may substitute copies to be marked for identification if he affords to all parties fair opportunity to verify the copies by comparison with the originals, and b. If the person producing the materials requests their return the officer shall mark them, give each party an opportunity to inspect and copy them, and return them to the person producing them, and the materials may then be used in the same manner as if annexed to and returned with the deposition. 2. Upon payment of reasonable charges therefore, the officer shall furnish a copy of the deposition to any party or the deponent. 3. The officer taking the deposition shall give prompt notice to all parties of its delivery to the party taking the deposition. 4. The filing of depositions shall be in accordance with the provisions of Trial Rule 5 e g. Failure to attend or to serve subpoena expenses. 1. If the party giving the notice of the taking of a deposition fails to attend and proceed therewith, and another party attends in person or by attorney pursuant to the notice, the court may order the party giving the notice to pay to such other party the amount of the reasonable expenses incurred by him and his attorney in so attending, including reasonable attorney's fees. 2. If the party giving the notice of the taking of a deposition of a witness other than a party fails to serve a subpoena upon him and the witness because of such failure does not attend, and if another party attends in person or by attorney because he expects the deposition of that witness to be taken, 
the court may order the party giving the notice to pay to such other party the amount of the reasonable expenses incurred by him and his attorney in so attending, including reasonable attorney's fees. Rule 31. Deposition of Witnesses Upon Written Questions A. Serving Questions Notice After commencement of Tehe action, any party may take the testimony of any person, including a party, by deposition upon written questions. The attendance of witnesses may be compelled by the use of subpoena as provided in Rule 45. The deposition of a person confined in prison may be taken only by leave of court on such terms as the court prescribes. A party desiring to take a deposition upon written questions shall serve them upon every other party with a notice stating 1. The name and address of the person who is to answer them, if known, and if the name is not known, a general description sufficient to identify him or the particular class or group to which he belongs and 2. The name or descriptive title and address of the officer before whom the deposition is to be taken. A deposition upon written questions may be taken of an organization, including a governmental organization, or a partnership in accordance with the provisions of Rule 30 b. 6. Within 20, 20 days after the notice and written questions are served, a party may serve cross-questions upon all other parties. Within 10, 10 days after being served with cross-questions, a party may serve very direct questions upon all other parties. Within 10, 10 days after being served with very direct questions, a party may serve very cross-questions upon all other parties. The court may for cause shown in the large or shorten the time b. Officer to take responses and prepare record. A copy of the notice and copies of all questions to RVED shall be delivered by the party taking the deposition to the officer designated in the notice, who shall proceed promptly, in the manner provided by Rule 30 c, e, and f, to take the testimony of the witness in response to the questions and to prepare, certify, and deliver the deposition attaching thereto the copy of the notice and the questions received by him, in accordance with Rule 5 e. c. Notice of Filing When the deposition is filed the party taking it shall promptly give notice thereof to all other parties. Rule 32. Use of Depositions in Court Proceedings a. Use of Depositions at the trial or upon the hearing of a motion or an interlocutory proceeding, any part or all of a deposition, so far as admissible under the rules of evidence applied as though the witness were then present and testifying, may be used against any party who is present or represented at the taking of the deposition by or against any party who had reasonable notice thereof or by any party in whose favor it was given in accordance with any one, one of the following provisions. 1. Any deposition may be used by any party for the purpose of contradicting or impeaching the testimony of deponent as a witness. 2. The deposition of a party or an agent or person authorized by a party to testify or furnish such evidence or of anyone who at the time of taking the deposition was an officer, director, or managing agent, executive officer or a person designated under Rule 30 b. 6 or 31 a. to testify on behalf of an organization, including a governmental organization or partnership which is a party may be used by an adverse party for any purpose. 3. The deposition of a witness, whether or not a party, may be used by any party for any purpose if the court finds a. Uh, that the witness is dead, or b. That the witness is outside the state, unless it appears that the absence of the witness was procured by the party offering the deposition, or c. That the witness is unable to attend or testify because of age, sickness, infirmity, or imprisonment. Or 
d that the party offering t he deposition has been unable to procure the attendance of the witness by subpoena or e upon application and notice that such exceptional circumstances exist as to make it desirable in the interest of justice and with due regard to the importance of presenting the testimony of witnesses orally in open court to allow the deposition to be used or f upon agreement of the parties for if only part of a deposition is offered in evidence by a party an adverse party may require him to introduce any other part which ought in context to be considered with the part introduced and any party may introduce any other parts substitution of parties pursuant to rule 25 does not affect the right to use depositions previously taken and when an action in any CR of the United States or of any state has been dismissed in another action involving the same subject matter is afterward brought between the same parties or their representatives or successors in interest, all depositions lawfully taken and duly filed in the former action may be used in the latter as if originally taken therefore. b. Objections to admissibility subject to the provisions of Rule 28b and Subdivision d. 3 of this rule. Objection may be made at the trial or hearing to receiving and evidence any depositions or part thereof for any reason which would require the exclusion of the evidence if the witness were then present and testifying. c. Effect of taking or using depositions. A party does not make a person his own witness for any purpose by taking his deposition. The introduction and evidence of the deposition or any part thereof for any purpose other than that of contradicting or impeaching the deponent makes the deponent the witness of the party introducing the deposition. But this shall not apply to the use by an adverse party of a deposition as described in subdivision. A. 2. Of this rule. At the trial or hearing any party may rebut any relevant evidence contained in a deposition whether introduced by him or by any other party. d. Effect of errors and irregularities in depositions. 1. As to notice. All errors and irregularities in the notice for taking a deposition are waived unless written objection is promptly served upon the party giving the notice. 2. As to disqualification of officer. Objection to taking a deposition because of disqualification of the officer before whom it is to be taken is waived unless made before the taking of the deposition begins or as soon thereafter as the disqualification becomes known or could be discovered with reasonable diligence. 3. As to taking of deposition. A. Uh, objections to the competency of a witness or to the competency, relevancy, or materiality of testimony are not waived by failure to make them before or during the taking of the deposition, unless the ground of the objection is one which might have been obviated or removed if presented at the time. B. Errors and irregularities occurring at the oral examination and the manner of taking the deposition, in the form of the questions or answers in the oath or affirmation, or in the conduct of parties and errors of any kind which might be obviated, removed, or cured if promptly presented, are waived unless reasonable objection or two is made at the taking of the deposition. c. Objections to the form of written questions submitted under Rule 31 are waived unless served in writing upon the party propounding them within the time allowed for serving the succeeding cross or other questions and within five, five days after service of the last questions authorized. 4. As to completion and return of deposition. Errors and irregularities in the manner in which the testimony is transcribed or the deposition is prepared, signed, certified, sealed, endorsed, transmitted, filed, or otherwise dealt with by the officer under Rules 30 and 31 are waived unless a motion to suppress the deposition or some part thereof is made with reasonable promptness after such defect is 
or with due diligence might have been, ascertained. Rule 33. Interrogatories to Parties. A. Availability Procedures for Use. Any party may serve upon any other party written interrogatories to be answered by the party served or, if the party served as an organization including a governmental organization, or a partnership, by any officer or agent. Who shall furnish such information as is available to the party? Interrogatories may, without leave of court, be served upon the plaintiff after commencement of the action and upon any other party with or after service of the summons and complaint upon that party. b. Format of interrogatory and response. A party who serves written interrogatories under this rule shall provide, after each interrogatory, a reasonable amount of space for a response or an objection. Answers or objections to interrogatories shall include the interrogatory which is being answered or to which an objection is made. The interrogatory which is being answered or objected to shall be placed immediately preceding the answer or objection. Each interrogatory shall be answered separately and fully in writing under oath, unless it is objected to in which event the reasons for objections shall be stated in lieu of an answer. The answers are to be signed by the person making them, and the objections signed by the attorney making them. c. Time for service, response, and sanctions. The party upon whom the interrogatories have been served shall serve a copy of the answers and objections within a period designated by the party submitting the interrogatories. Not less than 30, 30 days after the service thereof or within such shorter or longer time as the court may allow. The party submitting the interrogatories may move for an order under Rule 37a with respect to any objection to or other failure to answer an interrogatory. The part Y upon whom the interrogatories have been served may object to the failure to follow the format. Objection is to be made. The interrogatories shall be returned to the party who caused them to be served not later than the seventh, seventh day after they were received. If the interrogatories are not returned in that time, then this objection is waived. D. Scope use at trial. Interrogatories may relate to any matters which can be inquired into under Rule 26 B and the answers may be used to the extent permitted by the rules of evidence. An interrogatory otherwise proper is not objectionable merely because an answer to the interrogatory involves an opinion, contention, or legal conclusion, but the court may order that such an interrogatory be answered at a later time, or after designated discovery has been completed, or at a pre-trial conference, E. Option to produce business records. Where the answer to an interrogatory may be derived or ascertained from the business records of the party upon whom the interrogatory has been served or from an examination, audit or inspection of such business records, including a compilation, abstract or summary thereof, and the burden of deriving or ascertaining the answer is substantially the same for the party serving the interrogatory as for the party served. It is a sufficient answer to such interrogatory to specify the records from which the answer may be derived or ascertained and to afford to the party serving the interrogatory reasonable opportunity to examine, audit or inspect such records and to make copies, compilations, abstracts or summaries. A specification shall be in sufficient detail to permit the interrogating party to locate and to identify, as readily as can the party served, the records from which the answer may be ascertained. Rule 34. Production of documents, electronically stored information, and things an entry upon land for inspection and other purposes. A. Scope. Any party may serve on any other party a request. 1. To produce and permit the party making the request, or someone acting on the requester's behalf, to inspect and copy, 
any designated documents or electronically stored information, including, without limitation, writings, drawings, graphs, charts, photographs, sound recordings, images and other data or data compilations from which information can be obtained or translated, if necessary, by the respondent into reasonably usable form or to inspect and copy, test, or sample any designated tangible things which constitute or contain matters within the scope of Rule 26b and which are in the possession, custody or control of the party upon whom the request is served, or 2. To permit entry upon designated land or other property in the possession or control of the party upon whom the request is served for the purpose of inspection and measuring, surveying, photographing, testing, or sampling the property or any designated object or operation thereon, within the scope of Rule 26 b. b. Procedure. The request may, without leave of court, be served upon the plaintiff after commencement of the action and upon any other party with or after service of the summons and complaint upon that party. The request shall set forth the items to be inspected either by individual item or by category, and describe each item and category with reasonable particularity. The request may specify the form or forms in which electronically stored information is to be produced. The request shall specify a reasonable time, place, and manner of making the inspection and performing the related acts. Service is dispensed with if the whereabouts of the parties is unknown. The party upon whom the request is served shall serve a written response within a period designated in the request not less than 30, 30 days after the service thereof or within such shorter or longer time as the court may allow. The response shall state, with respect to each item or category, that inspection and related activities will be permitted as requested, unless it is objected to, including an objection.